With the fall of the infamous rogue agent, Aaron Keener, a new line of rogue agents were put into action to fulfill what he calls his legacy. With the first manhunt now concluded, what exactly were they trying to achieve? Molly Henderson, call sign Jupiter, was recruited by the division after proving herself in the private sector as a security consultant. Leaning on her four-year military background, Jupiter excelled in combat and physical training exercises. However, she was noted as a potential risk due to her past involvement in militant activism. She had been part of a group that was later involved in the kidnapping and assault of a prominent business executive. Nevertheless, nothing could ever be tied to her, as she claimed to have left the group by the time of the incident, and all psychological evaluations supported this claim. Jupiter was activated as part of the division's first wave, and it was at this time that she first met Aaron Keener. Her status was changed to Rogue after an incident in the New York quarantine zone, where two JTF officers were killed. Jupiter has since been linked to the murders of at least 15 JTF officers. Sometime after this, Keener returned to New York. He approached Jupiter and had her establish a team for a future attack that would be carried out in Washington, D.C. We need to go now. Is our extraction set? I got a boat waiting for you and your team in Jamaica Bay. Are you sure you can't take the lead on this mission? Your team is perfect. You work well together and I know I can trust you to handle things in Washington. Really wish you were coming with us. I can't leave New York now. There's too much at stake. Besides, my team doesn't really play well with others. That's fair. Still, we could use more bodies. Just in case things go sideways. Don't worry. I won't let you go without backup. Conley's left you a present. You're gonna like it. Just don't forget to feed them. One of the first agents that Jupiter got in contact with was Ryan Chang. Mutual friend thought we might be able to help each other out. This is Secure Channel? Secure enough. What's your name? You want a call sign for this op? Seems smart. Plants? Animals? Zodiac? Went to the planetarium last week. Always been partial to Mercury. Fine. Mercury. Name's Jupiter. Nice to meet you. Is it true you're working with the cleaners? I've got access, but Connolly... Uranus is their real leader. Mars brought us together. They're efficient. If I had a team like that here, we could have eradicated the outcasts in a couple of weeks. That's the goal. Mercury was recruited by the division from the military after earning a silver star in Afghanistan. He left the military and became a marketing manager for a tactical equipment company. Mercury was activated as part of the division's second wave, but was marked as rogue after reportedly torturing and executing prisoners. He has been described as intelligent and calculating, with a tendency for violent outbursts. Peer reviews regularly described him as being a bit difficult to work with. Earlier on, Mercury can be heard arguing with Kelso regarding the loading of supplies into a cargo plane. We need to finish getting those supplies ready for transport. This is a mistake. The shipment goes out tonight. We need this gear. We have enough supplies. We're just moving the surplus. If the hyenas or the true sons find out about this stockpile... If the true sons come for us, we will need these weapons to defend ourselves. You're a good agent, Ryan, but I need you to help me out and just... Finish the job. We don't have time to argue about this. The plane's already on its way. Mercury felt these supplies would be better used to help in the fight against the True Sons and the Hyenas. The cargo plane in question would later crash onto Roosevelt Island. Not long after this incident, Mercury was marked as rogue. Chadwick Brandon, callsign Neptune, was a flight engineer at the time of recruitment and was activated as part of the division's first wave. His job was to contain the civil unrest in the early days and to secure the midtown quarantine zone. Not long after activation, he ran into another agent called Mike. The two men started working together as a team, forming a tight bond. During his time with the SHD, Neptune set up a lot of the critical infrastructure at the base of operations, including a set of backup generators that could guarantee stable power and communications. 
However, when the retreat was called in the quarantine zone, Neptune and Mike were left surrounded by rioters, and no JTF to support them. While under heavy fire, Mike was gunned down, while Neptune only just managed to escape. Dismayed by the loss of his partner and close friend, Neptune held a grudge towards the JTF. He went on to sabotage the generators that he helped build in the base of operations, in turn killing 8 JTF staff members, and injuring 23 more. After that, Neptune disappeared. This is Division Agent Chadwick Brandon, reporting for Midtown Manhattan, final Midtown sit rep. The JTF left us behind. We lost. I don't know how many agents because of it. People who relied on the JTF support but never got it. We were supposed to tackle this together, but when the shit hit the fan, it was clear we were on our own. Mike died because of them. We ran into each other when we first got activated. We worked well together. I wasn't there for him. No one was. And now I'll never see him again. We're not going to forget this. Jupiter managed to track Neptune down and reached out to him. They're looking for you. Let them come. You think you can handle it? When a full squad storms in and surrounds you? I'm not going down without a fight. I'll take some of them with me. You die, they win. I don't give a shit anymore. This world can get fucked for all I care. I know you're hurting. I'll leave you with your grief. If you're still alive and want to do something, you know where to find me. We can fuck the world together. Initially, Neptune refused, but after he'd been given a little more time to mourn and think over it, he got back in contact with Jupiter. Lucy Anders, codenamed Venus, was a first wave division agent. Her status changed to rogue after she abandoned the mission, disappearing for six weeks. Investigations revealed that she had established her own safe house and was directly undermining the JTF's work by claiming critical drops and supplies destined for a JTF operations base. Later on, three division agents were dispatched to retrieve the stolen supplies. They managed to locate Venus, but two of the agents were killed and the third was seriously injured. This agent was able to survive and record an eyewitness account of the incident. Mary Masters, aka Saturn, was an attorney before she was recruited by the division. She was part of the first wave that was released after the dollar flu first struck. However, like many before her, she turned rogue not long after. Reports state that she shot down an extraction helicopter in Dark Zone West in Washington DC, killing two JTF pilots and a division agent. Her psychological evaluations indicate signs of trust issues and a lack of confidence in others. Mercury, this is Jupiter, come in. This is Mercury. We're set. Moving out tonight. Should be in your solar system in a couple of days. What? Code? We're coming to your neck of the woods. Should be there in a couple of days. Oh. Why didn't you just say that? We all set? Yeah. Black Tusk invaded the island, but local agents cleared them. Doesn't appear our cargo has been discovered. We should still be good to go. Great. You send me the coordinates? Mars' network up and running yet? Local test runs, but not system-wide. You should still be able to send direct messages. Great. You need anything special? If your intel's correct, we should have everything we need from the crash. Uranus is working on some new prototypes. Specs are saved on the network. Hopefully, we'll be able to test some of them once we get to Roosevelt. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Jupiter's team were preparing for the mission. Supplies had been stockpiled and were being loaded into the safe house. One of these included a red package from Aaron Keener. Jupiter, we got a care package from Keener. A red package. Yeah, I saw it. What do you want me to do with it? Get rid of it. I don't want anything to do with that. You sure? You saw what it could do at City Hall. This is the leverage Keener was talking about. This isn't some kind of silver bullet, Saturn. It's a fucking bioweapon. We're doing this to eradicate a virus, not spread something even more dangerous. Of course. You're right. I'll destroy it. 
Just be careful. I don't want to find out you dropped it and killed the whole team. Don't worry. I've got this under control. Yeah, that's what they all say. Until they don't. This package contained Kina's new super virus that had been developed by Trudenko, but Jupiter wanted nothing to do with this. Regardless of what Kina had in mind, Jupiter's mission was still the same, to remove the virus, to do what the JTF and the government were incapable of doing themselves. She wasn't going to replace the dollar flu with an even more deadly virus. Before Jupiter's team could roll out, she needed to ensure that their communications and logistics would be robust. She needed someone to stay behind and hold the fort. When do we leave? I need you to stay back on this one. You're kidding. Look, Saturn, you know I trust you. Yeah? You're the best agent I've got. Venus can be a little unpredictable, and Neptune's barely keeping it together. Can you blame him? <sighs> no. But that right there is why I need you here. You care about people. I need you to make sure the operation is secure. Fine. What do you need? Maintain the safe house. Keep comms open in case we need anything. You take care of the Eclipse? Yeah. Found a way to neutralize the dispersal mechanism, put it in a hole, blew it up, and buried the evidence. I knew I could count on you. Next mission? You're with me in the field. Jupiter couldn't trust Venus or Neptune to stay on track. Saturn was the most reliable option she had. Alright, here's the deal. I know you're Conley's guys, I know you answer to her. But, until this operation is over, you answer to me and my crew. I don't want to have any problems. We have a long journey and a hard road ahead of us. But, if we do this, if we get this right... We will be that much closer to eradicating the disease once and for all. We have multiple reports of experiments trying to weaponize the virus being carried out with the blood of asymptomatic carriers. We need to eliminate this threat. We're going to locate the labs, samples, and these carriers to make sure the green poison is destroyed once and for all. Their mission was to eradicate the green poison. Reports of experiments and weaponizing meant they were to focus on locating labs, samples, and carriers of the virus, and put an end to it once and for all. But with the introduction of the cleaners to the team, Jupiter found herself in an argument with Venus. She expressed her concerns about working with the fanatics, and that she didn't trust their intentions. In particular, Venus was having trouble with the leader of the cleaner backup, Barkley. With Buchanan or Baker or whatever the hell that guy's name is. You mean Barkley? I can't understand anything he says in that stupid fucking mask. What's the problem? He doesn't respect me. His team doesn't respect me. If they don't listen to me, they're gonna get us all killed. You're exaggerating. I'm not, Jupiter. Come on, you know me. Look, I can talk to him, but it's not going to make him respect you. You want him to respect you? Take care of it yourself. Oh, I'll take care of it. I just needed permission. Jupiter told her that they needed the backup, and that she needed to find a way of working with them, or that maybe she just wasn't suitable for the job at hand. So Venus took it upon herself to rather than reason with the guy, to instead shoot him. Barkley's dead. You told me to take care of it, so I took care of it. <sighs> I meant talk to him, not shoot him in the head. I did talk to him. He yelled at me and reached for his axe. My response was measured and appropriate. Hmm, uh, is that true? True enough. And now his team listens to me. So see, I took care of it. You didn't take care of it. You were supposed to gain their respect, not their fear, Venus. They listen to you now because they're afraid of you. But as soon as they aren't afraid, <laughs> you messed up. I thought you were better than this.
Mercury? Good to meet you, Jupiter. How was the trip? Fine. Couple of rough patches. Had to put out a couple of fires. You know, the usual. Everything set at the docks? We should be good. Supplies are a little low, need to send a couple of strike teams out for food, water, and weapons, but we've got plenty of space, and the boys are looking for fuel. You get me a list of what you need, and I can help you make those strike teams. You're good. I'm efficient. Jupiter's team was now in DC. Mercury initiated his attack on multiple sites, including the Capitol Building, Lincoln Memorial, Space Administration HQ, and Air and Space Museum, capturing a number of the control points in between while Neptune focused on the western side of DC. Venus made moves in northeastern DC, capturing multiple sites of value in Downtown East, Federal Triangle, and Judiciary Square, while Saturn continued to hold down the safe house in New York. One by one, the division was able to locate the rogue agents in DC, including Saturn's whereabouts in Lower Manhattan. Although they put up a strong fight, the division agents were quickly able to eliminate them. While this was happening, Jupiter was still running point on the main mission. While her team was being hunted down and killed by the Division, Jupiter was on Roosevelt Island. She was securing a newly developed EMP technology from a cargo plane that had crashed there some time ago. Combined with Vivian Conley's technology, these new EMP jammers were able to neutralize all non-rogue SHD tech and completely removed an agent's armor. Jupiter's goal was to capture this tech, get it operational, and ship it out to rogue agents nationwide. This would cripple the remaining SHD agents around the country. The purpose of her team of agents and the accompanying cleaners was to distract the division while she prepared Roosevelt Island. However, the division reacted faster than Jupiter was prepared for. The agents managed to overwhelm the rogues and push the cleaners back to the island, where Jupiter was forced to make a last stand. She ordered the cleaners to utilize all available EMP jammers put a stop to the fast approaching agents, but it was too late. The division pushed through the defences, destroying the EMPs, and found themselves face to face with Jupiter. And eventually, after a long battle, and embarrassingly longer than I'd like to admit, the agents put a stop to her plans, killing her in the process. Having technically already died once, one of Kina's lieutenants from the Division 1 is back, and more loyal to Kina's cause than ever. Hornet, Kina's most trusted agent, is leading a cell of rogues to fulfill his legacy. But who are they, and what are they planning? In the early days, Carter Leroux, codenamed Hornet, had his entire career path planned out for him by his parents. Studying economics, he was eventually interning for the family firm. But after a short stint, he felt unsatisfied with this direction and chose to sign up with the armed forces. Hornet joined the army and was stationed in Djibouti, Africa. During this time, he met future rogue agent Aaron Kina and they quickly struck up a friendship, becoming close brothers in arms. After he returned home, family tensions left Hornet feeling alienated and alone. He was lost and unsure of what to do with his life next. After everything he had seen, he just couldn't return to a desk job. However, he managed to keep in touch with Kina, who knew where he was coming from, and suggested he do something positive with his life, and sign up to the division. Kina put Hornet in touch with division recruiter Elijah Lee, who quickly signed him up due to his capabilities and experience. What do you think about Carter LaRue? Kina recommended him, said they grew up together. Grew up together? His file says he grew up in Michigan. That's not exactly Jersey. Looks like they served together in Djibouti. Figures. Pfft, stick a bunch of guys in a room, throw in some guns and an existential threat, and the next thing you know, they're all reborn and calling each other brother. It says he volunteered for service. That's exactly what scares me. He's a thrill seeker. Big game hunter, former futures trader. Sound familiar? 
What kind of person takes frequent trips to Zimbabwe to slaughter two-ton animals after returning from a war zone? A person who isn't afraid of a challenge. Or a person with a taste for killing. He follows the law, plays by the rules. What's to say we can't use that? We could do with a few more people like him to balance the books a little. If we're rubber stamping this guy, you're responsible for him if he starts hunting again. However, when Kina turned rogue, Hornet was the first agent to answer his call. With their history, he would continue to follow Kina's every move. After the second wave was activated, division agents were called upon to retrieve the Russian virologist Vitaly Trinenko in the Russian embassy. Kina called upon Hornet to secure Trinenko before the division got to him. Finding him locked up in a safe room within the embassy, Hornet used a breaching charge to blow open a wall while the division were on the other side of the safe room trying to talk their way in. The division pursued, but Hornet managed to extract the Russian scientist in a helicopter before they caught up to him. In an attempt to stall the agents, Hornet stayed behind and engaged them head on. The division managed to overwhelm and take him down. Leaving him for dead, the division moved on to return the information they had found on site to the base of operations. Having been fed information from a man on the inside, Kina made his way to the Russian consulate. Outside, he found Hornet, severely injured and dying. Kina brought him to Laurie Baker, a rogue agent and former army surgeon, who managed to bring him back from the brink of death. I can't believe you came for me. You don't leave a brother in the field, especially not on foreign soil. I lost Cherninko's research. It's okay. I failed you. Forget the consulate. You survived. You didn't fail me. This is just a setback. I'd be dead if it wasn't for you. Well, your heart stopped for a couple of seconds, so you were technically dead. But Termite's good. She brought you back. If you boys are done making out, I'd really like to move. This location's not secure. Can you walk? I'll get it together. You're stronger than anyone could ever know. And I know you will do great things. I won't let you down. Not again. This action only further enhanced Hornet's loyalty to Kina, becoming his closest ally in the days to come. He vowed to do everything in his power to help Kina on his mission. Working behind the scenes, Kina eventually resurfaced with a new variation of the virus that started it all. With some of his rogue agents, he attacked City Hall in Lower Manhattan. While Kina had the division's attention, he tasked Hornet with getting to Washington DC and recruiting an army to help with the cause. To help him get the job done, Kina supplied him with a number of Eclipse virus samples that he could use to persuade any likely candidates. Hornet set up for DC, along with four other rogue agents, consisting of Termite, Titan, Luna, and Huntsman. Laurie Baker, codenamed Termite, was trained as an army surgeon and took part in a number of military conflicts overseas. She was eventually dismissed from the military after failing to follow orders. Told to retreat during an attack on a hostile base in southern Afghanistan, she instead opted to stay, tending to a group of wounded soldiers. But this impressed division recruiters, showing independence and the ability to make difficult decisions in high stress situations. She was recruited and trained as a first wave division agent. Once activated, Termite was tasked with securing a quarantine centre that was set up by the government in New York City. But after witnessing the effect of the green poison, she began to lose confidence in the division's goal, believing that the only way to control the spread was to eliminate the sick and dying. What's her condition? High fever and abdominal pains. Move her to quarantine. Her test results came back negative. She's clean. It's not green poison. We can't take any chances. The medical wing is full. We have people sleeping in hallways and bathrooms. It's like an incubation chamber in She there. can't stay here. I am not gambling with her life. If we put her in quarantine with her immune system compromised, she won't make it a week. Then send her on her way. You can't keep admitting people off the streets like Ugh, this. I don't take my orders from the division. She's staying. The time to start listening was yesterday. If you keep insisting on making the wrong choices, I'll have to make the right ones for you. They're weak. They won't survive. We can't just leave them. I'm not suggesting we leave them. What are you suggesting? Do you really need me to say it? Say it. It's over. 
The more we fight it, the stronger it gets. There's only one option left. You sound just like those people out there burning this city to ash. We've seen this all before. Viruses appear and spread, but ultimately, they are defeated. Not this time. Eventually, the cleaners arrived to cleanse the hospital. Seeing this as an opportunity, Termite disavowed the division. Instead of holding off the attack, she killed a number of division agents and JTF, allowing the cleaners to break through the defense, in turn killing all patients and staff on site. I'm impressed. I don't have time for your bullshit, Keener. Yeah, it takes a particularly strong or broken person to facilitate mass euthanasia. You don't strike me as broken. You understand what we're up against. Listen, if you're trying to get me to repopulate the Earth with you, you're barking up the wrong tree. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Children are for people with free time. And our time is limited if we don't do something about it. You have to think about what kind of legacy you want to leave. You got something in mind? No, I, I got a plan. I just need to know if you're committed. Give me the elevator pitch and I'll tell you. We are going to eradicate the weak. I'm in. Kina saw this as an opportunity to recruit another agent to the cause. Termite would later be responsible for nursing Hornet back to health before eventually heading off to Washington DC on the recruitment mission. Tegan Silver, codenamed Luna, comes from the security industry where she has extensive experience. She was working for the State Department in Washington DC when she was activated. Her role was involved with closely monitoring internal operations. But when President Ellis ordered the JTF's withdrawal from the dark zone in New York, she began to lose faith in the government's ability to control the situation. You hear about New York? There is a massive outbreak in quarantine. Division agents have been activated to assist the JTF in regaining control of the city. Yeah, I heard. The JTF pulled out. Bullshit. Decided they lost enough people. Built a wall, locked it down, walled off the sick, hostiles. <laughs> Any agent foolish enough to stay behind. They can't do that. They can't just leave agents to die. Apparently they can. We have to do something. We have to stop them. Who gave the order? Ellis. It's too late. Gave the order an hour ago. Rumor is JTF moved out and the cleaners moved in. They're currently sterilizing the area. Sometime later, after Kina went rogue, and started recruiting. Elani Kelso brought Luna some encrypted echoes to reconstruct. These have been sent over by the division in New York. Hey Tegan, you busy? Nope, I've got time. I need you to work on some echoes for me. You got the base data, I can make you an echo. No, no, I don't need you to make me an echo, I need you to fix them. Okay, you have the files? Got a data transfer from an agent in New York. Lee, Lau, Lo, something like that. She's been collecting encrypted echoes. I was hoping that maybe one of our techs could find anything to help her identify or locate these rogues. I'll do what I can. Tegan, you're the best. Oh, you a Kermans. Although Luna was tasked with tracking the rogue agents down, she found herself listening to a man who shared her views. Becoming a believer in Kina's vision for the future, she managed to create a connection to the rogue network frequency that he was using. Vanguard? Luna? How did you get on this line? Uh, your encryption isn't bad, but I cracked it in maybe 20 minutes. You're lucky Alani brought me your echoes to crack. I've been listening. I want to help. How do I know I can trust you? Well, you'll have to take my word for it. For now, that's all I've got. Words mean nothing without actions. What can you offer? You've seen what I can do. The Division still thinks I'm one of them. So you want to be my man on the inside? I do, sir. I think it's criminal what they did to you. No one can realistically think that the way out of this crisis is to save what remains. I'm glad you understand what we're trying to do here. There's only one way to end tyranny. Anarchy. You're a smart cookie. Luna had become Kina's agent on the inside of the division, and was able to feed him intel, allowing him to continue to be several steps ahead of them. It was Luna that informed Kina of the division's operation to secure Vitaly Trenenko at the Russian consulate. This gave Kina the opportunity to react and warn Hornet of their approach. This warning, however, would have her finally being flagged as a rogue agent. She would be reassigned to a position of surveillance for Kina's operation. Elijah Lee, codenamed Huntsman, 
worked in the bomb disposal unit in Afghanistan. Over time, he earned a silver star for bravery. However, after tripping an explosive device one day, he was given an honourable discharge and spent a year undergoing physical therapy for his injuries. Later on, he was hired by the division as a recruiter. In fact, he was the one responsible for hiring both Keener and Hornet. When the situation arose and the first wave of agents were activated, Huntsman used the opportunity to join them out in the field as an agent. But over time, like many before him, he lost faith in the division's ability to get on top of the situation. And with the deployment of the last man battalion, he saw them as the ones who would be able to get on top of the anarchy that was starting to unfold. I just want you to understand one thing, Charles. I'm not doing this because I think the division was a mistake. I'm doing this because the division is failing. Right now, the last man battalion has the best chance to take control of this shit show. Besides, I always look good in winter camo. Eventually, the division took down the last man battalion leader, Charles Bliss. And after his death, Huntsman was left not knowing what to do. Lost. Of course, thanks to Luna's intel, Kena knew all about his situation and offered him a job. I was sorry to hear about Bliss. Charles was a good man. A good man don't make it very far in this world. What do you want, Kena? To give you a job. I've got a job. Without Bliss, your buddies won't stick around. They'll join the next PMC to come along and promise them a hot meal. You know I'm not like that. I do. You're committed. You're loyal. Once you make a decision, you stick with it until you decide to abandon it. Only two things you've ever quit are the division and that cocker spaniel kept pissing on your carpet. Fuck that dog. And the ex-wife he rode in on. <laughs> That's her problem now. This was her problem. Karen died last week. Well, I guess there's a silver lining. Where are you getting your intel? I got someone in D.C. Luna's got her ear to the ground and an eye in the sky. Say hi. Hey, Huntsman. Who the fuck is Huntsman? You are. If you're ready. Jason Barnes, codenamed Titan, spent 10 years as a firefighter before gaining a diploma in wildland fire science and training as a smoke jumper. After years of witnessing the destruction of nature, he became an outspoken environmentalist. He was noticed by the division after he survived for six days stuck in a wildland fire that took the lives of the rest of his unit. Due to quickly spreading fires in city parks, Titan was recruited and then quickly activated during the second wave. He didn't actually receive any formal division training. We're activating the second wave. We need you in New York. Is it as bad as they say it is? It's worse. And it's not just the green poison that's spreading. We've got paranoid residents burning everything in sight. It's raining ash and the fire department's overwhelmed. There's no way inside unless you go in from the top. Think you can handle it? I can handle it. What do you need from me? You'll drop down over Central Park. We need you to coordinate the trench build along the perimeter. What do you need from us? A pretty orange watch. You're easy to please. Just send a helo and brief me on the way. Thank you. And welcome to the division, Agent. After being treated for severe smoke inhalation, he was taken to a Sarah hospital where he was surrounded by victims of the green poison. He saw firsthand the destruction caused by the virus. Although Titan was injured, he refused to stay in the hospital. Even with a nurse trying to stop him, Titan got as far away from there as possible. I know you're only doing what you think is right. And in some way, I admire that. Truth is, I don't understand what you're fighting for, and I don't think you do either. You call this a crisis. You think that death is a tragedy. But the real tragedy is how our innate desire for survival overshadows our appreciation for life. This is an opportunity. How much devastation will it take to realize that perhaps we are the poison? Maybe it's time to accept our punishment and let nature decide what's best for the world. This experience led him to question everything that they were doing. As a true eco-terrorist, he began wondering if this whole thing was nature's way of trying to survive. Jason Barnes, the agent with no official division training. Congratulations on the promotion. 
Seems like you're smarter than the rest of us. You didn't call to give me compliments, Keener. I liked your manifesto. Thought I'd share my enthusiasm. <sighs> You've got it all wrong. Sooner or later, we're all gonna die. I guess the real question is, what do you want to leave behind? That's the point. I don't want to leave anything behind. Well, not even a legacy. Green poison will run its course, and then the same people who trashed this planet will try to rebuild it and end up destroying it for good. But with a little intervention, you could change that future. Even though the goals were different, the methods of getting there were the same. Titan agreed to join Keener and his rogues, and stop humanity from continuing down the same path they were headed before the outbreak. Once in DC, Hornet set forth with recruiting. He saw the outcasts as a good place to start, since they were currently leaderless and in need of a purpose. But they aren't exactly friendly to strangers. However, he had a different way of getting their attention. What the hell happened here? You think it was the true sons? It's not like them. This was chemical. Maybe it was green poison. Impossible! People don't just drop dead like that! Stay away from that smoke! It's called Eclipse. Don't fucking move! Careful! His watch is red! Relax. I keep my eyes open. The JTF have been causing you trouble. Thought I'd ease that burden for you. Besides, I needed to get your attention somehow. Your people aren't too friendly to strangers. We should kill them. I wouldn't advise that. Fear of green poison is the only real weapon you have, and that won't last much longer with antivirals starting to circulate. You've seen what the Eclipse virus is capable of, and I've got plenty to go around. It was around this time that the Division had caught up to Kena, and after chasing clues around southern Manhattan, they eventually faced off with him on Liberty Island, where he was finally brought down and eliminated. This led to in-house fighting between Huntsman and Hornet, with Huntsman eager to take over where Kena left off, and Hornet, Kena's closest ally, having vowed to keep things on track. Who died and put you in charge? Fuck you, Huntsman. A real leader knows how to work through his grief without lashing out at others. Sure. You trying to make this power play now? That's just perfect. Do you think you're half as smart as he was? Oh, I don't think. I know. And face it, kid. You're not ready to lead this op. Why don't you let the adults handle this one? Keener left me in charge. He trusted me with the Eclipse recipe. You're not a leader. You're just running around, stinging my ass. And you're just a creepy-ass spider hiding in the corner. Too small and chicken shit to do anything, regardless of how poisonous your bite may be. You've been working on that for a while now, kid, haven't you? Fall in line or get the fuck out. Each one of Hornet's team of rogue agents split up to cover more ground in DC. Termites set off attacking multiple sites, including bank headquarters, the Federal Emergency Bunker, Manning National Zoo, and Camp White Oak, while Titan focused on the western side of DC, including the Pentagon and DARPA labs. Huntsman made moves in southeastern DC, capturing multiple sites of value in Judiciary Square, Federal Triangle, Southwest, and East Mall, while Luna continued to run surveillance from a safe house in New York. One by one, the division was able to locate the rogue agents in DC, including Luna's whereabouts in Lower Manhattan. Although they put up a strong fight, the division agents were quickly able to take them down. While all of this was happening, Hornet was at Tidal Basin with his new army of outcasts. As per Kena's instructions, he had been busy producing stockpiles of the Eclipse virus and was getting ready to move out. The loss of his team of rogues meant that the division was quickly able to locate him. The division assaulted the compound, only slowing down to avoid the pockets of Eclipse virus that Hornet had released across the site in an attempt to block and kill the agents. After fighting through waves of outcast forces, the division managed to destroy the virus supplies. While frantically loading the remaining supplies onto the hovercraft, Hornet and his outcasts were attempting to escape before the division were able to reach them. But the agents caught up to him, quickly dealing to the outcasts and destroying the samples on board. Hornet launched an attack on the division. However, they proved too much, and were able to bring him down and eliminate him. This time, for good.
Time and time again, the Black Tusk have been hindering the Strategic Homeland Division's attempts at regaining control of the nation's capital. So it's finally time to remove the BTSU leader from the equation. But why does he suddenly have a bunch of ex-Division agents working with him? And what was with that bloody hunter that kept smacking me in the back of the head while my back was turned? Barden Schaefer is the leader of the Black Tusk Specialist Unit, the BTSU. He comes from a family with a proud, traditional and long line of military service, and at the age of 19 dropped out of college and enlisted in the army. There he took no time at all in showing an exceptionally high degree of skill, which resulted in a swift and steady rise through the ranks. Barden served multiple tours of Iraq and Afghanistan. He quickly became known for his highly tactical way of assessing situations and having the ability to eliminate targets with extreme efficiency. Later, he was assigned to a special forces unit where he was involved in a number of dark ops before eventually being approached by the Black Tusk. Highly respected among his colleagues, it wasn't long before he was given the role of specialist unit leader. He was given the task of gaining control of Washington DC so his employers could establish a new government. Barden legitimately believes he is a true patriot, and that everything he's doing is for the betterment of the country. The division only answers to the president, but now that he has joined with the BTSU, they no longer listen to him, so they're traitors. In his eyes, the existing government is corrupt, and the division are nothing more than a rogue agency. After the division discovered Agent Lau and Coswold had teamed up with Barden, they realized that his threat level was only increasing regardless of how many of his ops that they were putting a stop to. They needed to target the man himself. But Barden had been busy, and was recruiting other division agents too. Ones who had had a change of heart, and had turned their back on the SHD. Some of these rogues included Shade, Wraith, Dusk, and Belfry. Marley Yarrow, codenamed Shade was a parole officer in New York City, and a large number of the people she dealt with were released from Rikers Island. After she was activated as part of the second wave in New York City, she became aware of the horrific event that was about to unfold when the call was made to abandon the prisoners and leave them to starve. She knew these people and what they were capable of achieving. Just because they are prisoners, they shouldn't be left to slowly die. It would be kinder just to shoot them. She had witnessed these people do great things after their time incarcerated. Some of them were good people that had simply found themselves in the wrong situations. Some had been locked up for reasonably minor offences and were only serving a term of 12 months or less. And some of them hadn't even been convicted yet. Often these were the people who couldn't afford bail, who were awaiting trial. Not long after, James Dragoff, the division agent who had killed the warden on Rikers Island and then freed the prisoners, approached her. He asked for her assistance in supporting his family of Rikers. She obliged and began working alongside him, in turn marking her as a rogue agent. Prior to joining Dragoff, she had worked closely with Fei Lau, and after Dragoff's death, Fei introduced her to Barden Schaefer. You'll get the delivery tomorrow. Thanks, Schaefer. You'll get that destabilization you're looking for. That's not the goal, Shade. We'll keep the division busy, so you can do whatever high-level espionage it is you need to do. Well, if you're so smart, why the hell are you running with the Rikers? You want to be on the winning side, right? I want to be on the right side. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Not overly convinced by Barden's claims that he was fighting for the side that was right, she agreed to support him in exchange for supplies that the Rikers desperately needed. However, gossip quickly started to spread through the Riker ranks about how she was working with Barden Schaefer. Delivery tomorrow. Get a recovery team together. We get coordinates, we're just hoping for some shit to fall out of the sky. We'll get them an hour before the drop. Safer that way. Shit, I was joking. I heard you talking to Schaefer. You forget that name. Okay. Stop playing. You know what happens to people who play with me. Sorry, boss. Not today. Sueko Tanagi, codenamed Wraith, was a logistics officer in the US Army. After she left the armed forces, she returned home to Atlanta and found a job in her field of expertise, 
and started working as a logistics officer for a large transportation company. Later on, she was recruited by the division, and using the skills of her trade, she was activated to help keep Sarah's supply lines operational at a crucial point where the global economy was starting to collapse. However, at the same time, she was approached by the Black Tusk. She decided that this was the perfect opportunity and went on to exploit and control supply to both the US government and the global corporation that is behind the Black Tusk. Wraith is an opportunist and has no problem working both sides in order to benefit herself. She is arrogant, narcissistic, and gutsy enough to exploit two of the largest, most powerful organizations around. She is all about working the system, whether it be corporations or people. And when it comes to the hyenas, they are weak-minded substance abusers, constantly trying to get their next fix. And she's the one capable of fulfilling this need, in turn, making them her puppets. She is very good at getting what she wants. Not long after going rogue, her and Barden made contact. Barden knew that Wraith and the hyenas would become a valuable asset in the days to come, so he was eager to win her over in order for her to assist in the operation. Lynette Edwards, codename Dusk, was a third generation Marine. She had chosen to follow in her family's tradition and pursue a military career. However, it was her father that put in a recommendation to the SHD. She was recruited shortly after her first tour of duty. Dusk was activated in Washington DC, but it didn't take long for her to come to the conclusion that the institution was corrupt. In fact, she was finding herself more and more aligned with the True Sun's way of thinking than the SHD. Seeing all the tragedy caused by the virus and how overwhelmed the JTF had become, Dusk started losing faith in the Division's ability to save Washington DC. She quickly came to the conclusion that more drastic actions needed to be taken to ensure their survival. As a strong believer in the need for proper authority and discipline, in her eyes, the True Sons were the only ones with a realistic and viable solution to the situation. She eventually decided that enough was enough. She turned rogue and joined up with the True Sons. When the True Sons leader, Antoine Ridgeway, was eventually hunted down and killed by the Division, Dusk went on to continue Ridgeway's work with a group of True Sons who were devoted to his cause. Dusk is loyal, patriotic, and cares greatly for her comrades. Unfortunately, the attacks had left them weakened and short on supplies. We need anything. Running low on rations, bullets, grenades, and men. So just everything? Pretty much. How long can we hold out on the current stockpile? A week. Maybe more if we stop feeding the privates. I'll start eating rats before we stop feeding our men. That's how you get a mutiny. She would do whatever it took to help her new family, even if it meant making a deal with the devil. Dusk would use her contacts to gain a connection within the Black Tusk and offer a trade in return for food, water, and weapons. Skylar Williams, codename Belfry, served in the US Army and was eventually approached by the SHD and recruited as an agent. After retiring from the Army, he went on to become a local police officer in a predominantly residential commuter town. Following the outbreak, he was activated in his home state of Maryland, but was stationed at the Washington DC Sierra Camp in DZ South. But unfortunately, it was his experience in these camps that would change his allegiance. He witnessed the insufficiently tested chemical called DC-62 being pushed into these camps by the people who were supposed to be protecting them. Belfry watched countless families succumb to this lethal yellow powder, gasping for air, clawing frantically at their throats while the toxic fumes burned their lungs, causing asphyxiation and ultimately their death. Questioning his role as a division agent, feeling partially responsible and equally helpless at the same time, he left his post in turn being flagged as rogue. Eventually he made contact with Barden, where he would offer his assistance in exchange for supplies. He was working to help other victims of these quarantine camps, the outcasts. Congratulations, Lau. You just got a new assignment. Sniper duty? No, BTSU. 
You're no assassin. What, you want to be a sniper now? <laughs> Pretty sure you need depth perception for that gig. Wouldn't work even if you had a robo-eye. I've seen you in the field. You like getting your hands dirty. No, I don't. But I'm not afraid to do what's necessary. You ready to work directly for the president? For your country? <sighs> funny. What's funny? You just promoted me to my old job. The division was activated by the president, but as soon as they went against him and your AI forgot to update the line of succession, you stopped working for the president. The way I see it, you and the rogues we've recruited are the only agents still on mission. But that doesn't mean I have to like it or you. Baden made it official by giving Faye a position within the BTSU ranks. Her first job, to guard President Ellis. But this is where things started to become a little more difficult than he'd expected. The rogue agents Faye had introduced to Baden weren't exactly what you'd call low maintenance. Bringing them on board came at a considerable cost, and they were proving to be somewhat challenging to work with. Well done, Schaefer. You made the deadline. I'm a man of my word. For now. I need another delivery. You know you're not my only operator. I know, but I'm your best. And if you want to keep me happy, you'll find a way to get a delivery of tear gas to Judiciary Square. The sooner the better. Whatever you need, Wraith. I aim to please. That's my good boy. I knew you wouldn't let me down. Get a crew together. Supply or combat? Supply. Got a new contact. Needs to prove himself. Oh, shit. We're getting helicopter drones? Uh, no. I didn't ask for anything that bad, shit. Too bad. I could do some real damage with one of those. Yeah. Pretty sure you just get high and blow up another safe house. Button obliged Wraith's request. He knew she had substantial influence over the hyenas. And he needed them. They had a part to play in the upcoming op. Unfortunately, Wraith knew this, and had no problem testing how far she could push things to get what she wanted. Schaefer! Wraith, what can I do for you now? You can get that tone out of your voice. What can I do for you, Wraith? You got an ETA on my delivery. Should have everything ready for your deadline tomorrow. Good boy. You sure you don't need anything else? Mm, just the tear gas. When you said you were going to test me, I expected a test. <laughs> You're still being tested. You haven't made the delivery yet. I value punctuality. I'm always on time. We'll see. Dusk contacted Barden and explained the situation that her and the True Sons were in. Supplies were critically low and they didn't have enough weapons to go around. Barden agreed to the request of assistance and made a deal where they would work together. Schaefer, need an emergency supply drop. What kind? Weapons or rations? Yes. Airdrop, or do you need a delivery? Whatever gets my men fed and armed by tomorrow. You got enough ammo to take on hostiles? One and two squads, then it gets dicey. I can arrange an airdrop and send coordinates. Have your team there in two hours. Thanks, Schaefer. No problem, Dusk. Schaefer? How can I help you, Dusk? Want to let you know we got the supply drop. Glad to hear it. My boys are fed and armed and ready to fight. Glad to hear it. What do you need? Wanted to set up a meet. What for? I like to know who I'm working with. I always find a face-to-face -face tells you so much more than a voice on the radio. Fair enough. Whenever you're free, come meet me in Southwest. I've got a safe house there. Looking forward to meeting you. Sounds good. Looking forward to meeting you too, Dusk. However, this was all getting a bit much. His budget was being strained, and resources stretched thin. Barton started questioning whether these rogue agents were even worth all of this hassle, and if they could even be trusted. He contacted Faye to discuss his concerns. Faye, this is Schaefer. I'm worried this op is getting a little expensive. Are we sure we want to spend all these resources on the hyenas and the true sons? Dusk wants to meet up in person now. Either she's got a crush on me, or this is a trap. How well do you really know these people we're working with? Unable to get hold of Faye, he decided to take a step back and assess the situation while dealing with other pressing matters. But it was during this time that the rogue agents started to feel neglected. Went to the meet, but you weren't there. What happened? Sorry, had to handle something in DC. You're the one who wanted to meet, and you stand me up. I didn't mean to disrespect you. I should have called. 
But these comms aren't the most secure, and I didn't want to give away your location. That's okay, Schaefer. This time, you come to me. It's too much of a pain in the ass for me to get off the island. Name the time and place. I'll be there. Once you land in two bridges, ping me, and I'll send coordinates. What is it, Belfry? You working with Schaefer? Yeah, you know I am. What do you think of him? Ooh, very professional. You've been getting your deliveries. Yeah, on time and in full. Fuck. You're not? No. Ooh, guess he likes me better than you. Dusk. What is it, Belfry? What do you think of Schaefer? You like working with him? He's my bitch. What's not to like? You getting your deliveries? Yeah. He saved my ass last week with a ration supply drop. Fuck. He blowing you off? He's not responding to my calls. Maybe he realized your crazy ass was a lost cause and cut his losses. <laughs> Thanks, Dusk. Hope he cuts you too. Schaefer, this is Belfry. Come in. What can I do for you? We're running low on munitions, incendiaries, and rations. We need a delivery yesterday. I can get an airdrop put together for you in two hours. Have something to take care of first. Just need a drop zone. West End. I have a recovery team based there. Perfect. I'll put it together. Hold tight. The supply drop will be there soon. Don't leave me hanging again. I wouldn't do that. You can trust me. And as every parent knows, when the kids feel neglected, they start to play up. You should really be using code. Or get us more secure channels. I've got to work with the tools at my disposal, Wraith. Seems a bit reckless. Makes me worry about you, Schaefer. Sweet of you to worry. You're sloppy. Either you're trying to get yourself or me killed. And if you're trying to get me killed, I hate to disappoint you, but better men have tried and failed. Wraith. I'm not suicidal, and I know that your position with the hyenas allows us to operate more freely in DC. I see your value. I am not sloppy. But resources are limited, and we all have to make do with what we have. Well done. You didn't yell at me. You had a reasonable answer for your way of working, and complimented me. Well done. You passed the test. Barton is a patient man who had no problem staying composed, as he has dealt with many challenging situations in his career, but he was starting to doubt whether he could work with these people. Unable to get in contact with Faye, he talks to someone by the name of Natalia Sokolova. Natalia, I'm not sure about this op. They wanted Black Tusk to collaborate with the government. This is Faye's chance to prove her agents are worthy and our chance to keep my business partners happy. I think the only thing she's proving is the division really needed a better screening process. You brought her in. Her failures are yours. Fix it. I do not tolerate failure. I understand. It isn't clear who Natalia is to Barden, but she's certainly the one calling the shots. She could be someone further up the chain within the Black Tusk, or maybe even the main contact for the organization that has employed them. Barden instructed Shade to wreak havoc on the division in New York City. She set to work attacking multiple sites in the Financial District, Civic Center, and Two Bridges. While Wraith focused on the northeastern side of DC, including Downtown West, Downtown East, Federal Triangle, and Judiciary Square. Dusk made moves in southeastern DC, capturing multiple sites of value in East Mall, Southwest, and Capitol Hill and Belfry directed his efforts towards the west side of DC, including the districts of Constitution Hall, Foggy Bottom, and West End, but also New York's Coney Island. One by one, the division was able to locate the rogue agents in Lower Manhattan and DC. Although they put up a strong fight, the division agents were quickly able to take them down. But this did include the assistance from an unlikely foe. In each instance, when finally able to detect the location of the rogue agents, a hunter would appear. Interestingly, he didn't seem to be focused solely on the division agents. He was hostile to both sides of the conflict. Regardless, having eliminated his rogue agents, Barton Schaefer eventually made his location known. He was on Coney Island. 
division agents had to navigate their way through the amusement park, which was riddled with Rikers. Yet a familiar face kept making an appearance. The hunter, that the agents had met time and time again while disposing of Barden's rogues, was also there. And this hunter was taking down Rikers faster than the agents were able to progress through the park. Whenever they would get close, he would vanish. Over the comms, Barden could be heard telling the hunter to quit playing around and kill the agents. And this is where the division met, face to face, with the hunter that had been following them throughout this operation. After a long, dare I say it, couple of attempts even, the agents managed to take down the hunter. Barden updated Natalia Sokolova. She inquired of the hunter asset, and when Barden informed her that he had been eliminated, she ordered him to clean up his mess and finish the job. Barden instructed his group of elite BTSU operators to assemble and prepare for the fast approaching division agents. But the agents made short work of them, and within no time at all, Barden's guards were quickly disposed of. In a final offensive push, Barden took the fight to the agents, and although he was strong and put up a formidable resistance, they eventually managed to take him down. Barden was critically injured, but not killed. A halo was sent in to retrieve him, where he would be brought back to health, and then questioned on his knowledge around the Black Tusk and the organization who had employed them. Manhunt Season 4 is now open, and for the first target, agents are tasked with locating Bridget Douglas, codename Viper. Viper brings some interesting additions to the story, including the first confirmed Black Tusk recruitment from outside of the US military, and a possible link to other waves of Division agents that are yet to be activated. Viper is the only child of Charles Douglas the co-founder of a military equipment company. She grew up on a secluded, luxurious estate in the Scottish Highlands. After graduating from university, Viper completed an eight-year stint in the SAS before taking a position in her father's company, Douglas and Harding, as a logistics and supply specialist. However, when the dollar flu outbreak hit, she was immediately contacted by the Black Tusk. Yet, this was after she was recruited by the Strategic Homeland Division. Completely disregarding her father's opposition to the idea, she joined up with the BTSU shortly after. Fast forward a few months, Fei Lao has sided with Schaefer and the BTSU. She was inducted into the group, meeting several prominent members, and Viper was among them. SAS. That's impressive. Logistics and supply specialist. Not that impressive. You shouldn't do that. Do what? Sell yourself short. You are impressive. You didn't have to join the services. Rich girl like you had other options. Just because my father has money, it doesn't mean I'm some spoiled rich girl. I can take care of myself. Your record proves that. You joined the Black Tusk in December? That's correct. Before you were activated. I was never activated. Guess they're still saving some of us for the real end times. Does Schaefer know your division? He never asked, and I didn't think it was worth bringing up until it was a problem. Smart. I like smart women. Me too. Being that Fei Lau was the acting division commander in New York, she would have had access to highly confidential intel and was aware of Viper's recruitment into the division. Viper was keeping this information from Schaefer and she chose to hold this information from him unless approached about it. She had spent her whole life having people assume that she has it easy, everything given to her on a silver platter, and that she had no idea of the stresses and complications that the average person faced. But through issues with her father in their earlier years, she did her utmost to separate herself from the privileged lifestyle and carve her own path. And this just happened to be in a direction that her father wouldn't approve of, which probably only made the path that much more appealing. Following the outbreak, Charles Douglas can be seen talking to his business partner, John Harding. Twenty-seven years we spent building DNH. Have you ever known me to be a paranoid lunatic? Of course not. But there is no conspiracy, Charles. <laughs> Everyone's just preparing. All this panic will die down soon enough. Someone is freezing us out. We supply militaries, for God's sake. If we can't book factory time, this company is going down the path. Look. 
forget about this conspiracy theory of yours. There's no secret cabal trying to freeze us out. Let's just focus on sorting out of this mess. I swear, something big is happening. Fine. Think what you want. I don't have enough energy to fight you on this right now. <laughs> With the current state of Washington DC and the rest of America, it was having an effect on business, with the closing down of factories and inadequate numbers to run them. Charles was certain that there was something going on that was targeting DNH weapons manufacturing. However, not long after this conversation, John Harding would pass away due to complications from influenza. As the situation continued to get worse in DC, Charles eventually relocated to the White House, where he is working and I use this term very loosely, as the range officer in the shooting range. As a father, Charles was very hard on Viper. She found him a difficult man to please, who was constantly critical towards everything she did and would often downplay her achievements. This in turn resulted in her moving in life directions that were against his will. Although this meant she was forced to grow up to be strong and independent, she still bears the scars of a very critical upbringing. Viper doesn't think particularly highly of herself, and tends to be a little insecure around her abilities. You're sure he's at the White House? That's what Kelso said. He's running a shooting range and drinking dandelion coffee from a very fancy espresso machine. Oh, well that sounds like my dad. <laughs> he's doing great. Found a way to make himself useful. He was lucky. Never caught the virus and still has all his parts. Aside from the dandelion, instead of his regular Kopi Luwak, it sounds like his life hasn't changed much. He's still in the lab, getting people to test his equipment and probably making them feel really insecure about their accuracy. You miss him? Of course. But when something like this happens, you have to do what you think is right. I'm glad we each found something. Even if he is actively making my life harder. Which, yeah, that hasn't really changed much either. Leading up to the operation, Faye discusses the role that Viper will play. I'm best in a support role. You don't want to lead your own team? I prefer to be in a support role. I get that. Some people aren't cut out to make the hard choices. Oh, that's not what I'm worried about. What are you worried about? Being responsible for my team's life. You'll make sacrifices to save them. No. That I'll consider their deaths an acceptable loss. We know what we signed up for. We assume this is a suicide mission. If you make it back home, that's the unexpected outcome. You worried about survivor's guilt? Can't be worried about something you can't control, and every mission I come back from, I never feel guilty. Not about being the one that comes back. Other shit? Sure. But never that I survived. Viper isn't interested in leading a team. Not because she's scared of the responsibility, more that she's worried about treating them as expendable. In her career, she was always aware of what they were there for, and that there was a chance that they may never return. But in this situation, the men she would lead would be relying on her to keep them alive. Regardless, Faye pushed her out of her comfort zone and assigned her a squad. How's it feel? Good. Weird. I like being in charge, but... Yeah, it's, it's weird being the one people are looking to for guidance. Your team speaks highly of you, Viper. You're a natural leader. Likeable, kind, tough when you need to be. They respect you, but aren't intimidated by you. Cool? That's hard to pull off. Especially for a woman. Thanks. I try not to be a bitch. I'm still working on that one. To Viper's surprise, she was actually quite suited to the task of leading a team. She is a valuable and well-respected leader. When instructed to do so, Viper set forth, executing her part in the operation. Taking her band of BTSU, she started creating havoc in the southern districts of Washington DC. Multiple sites of interest were captured in West Potomac, East Mall, Southwest, and also the Pentagon. One by one, the division took back these areas, eliminating all Black Tusk who engaged them. Eventually, they managed to catch up with Viper. Although she put up a strong resistance, the agents managed to put a stop to her activities and take her down. In turn, removing Fei Lao's first lieutenant from the field. It isn't clear what Viper's part in this operation was, but through continuing to hunt down the remainder of the lieutenants, 
phase plan and location should hopefully become known. The latest target in the Season 4 Manhunt has confirmed a few suspicions that have been discussed up until now. Felix Sokolov has been reunited with his sister, and he is thrilled to be able to grow and work together in her newly acquired empire. But does she share the same intentions? Russian businessman Alexei Sokolov is the founder and CEO of the hugely successful international military equipment manufacturer Sokolov Concern. Alexei had a daughter to an earlier relationship that separated later for unknown reasons. He later married an American woman, and eventually they had his first and only son, Felix. As a family, they decided to relocate to his wife's country of birth, the United States, but left behind his daughter to keep the family business ticking along. Her name was Natalia Sokolova. Alexei was hard on Felix and had high hopes and expectations that he forced upon him. As soon as he graduated from school, Felix was told by his father that he must enlist with the Navy. While on deployment, his father died under suspicious circumstances, and after a lengthy court battle, Felix's mother was eventually convicted of his murder. When his tour was over, he moved on to study medicine at John Hopkins University. It was during this time that he was recruited by the Strategic Homeland Division. But regardless, sometime after completing his study, he was approached and recruited by the Black Tusk. After her father's death and her stepmother's conviction, Natalia reached out to Felix. She went on to fund his studies and attempt to reunite with a brother that she barely knew. When Baden Schaefer brought Fei Lao on board, she met up with Felix during her induction. You were a good agent, Felix. What made you leave the division? Family. I get that. You lose someone? My sister. The virus? No. Rikers. I couldn't keep her safe. Budget cuts. Well, you'll never have that problem with Black Tusk. Natalia will get us anything we need. Natalia? My sister. She runs this entire operation. Anything you need, I can get it. You don't think it's weird she'd let you work in the field? It's not the safest place for a kid like you. You've read my profile, you know I've served before. It's why the division recruited me. Well, that and I'm sure they got a family discount on those knee pads you were wearing when Schaefer brought you in. It's unclear whether Natalia's name and involvement with the Black Tusk was a surprise to Faye or not but she didn't seem overly convinced that Natalia's intentions towards Felix were purely about tight family bonds. You asking the other candidates this much about their families? Only when it's relevant. So what else do you want to know? How close are you with your sister? Not as close as I'd like. It's hard. She grew up in Russia. I didn't really get to know her until after our father died. That was what, six or seven years ago? Six? What does it matter? Nothing. Just, that's around the same time she started Black Tusk. So? Oh, nothing. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. It's interesting that your father dies, she reconnects or connects with you. She inherits the company and builds this PMC. It just seems like... Never mind. <laughs> I'm seeing conspiracies where they probably don't exist. My sister loves me. I'm sure she does. When we lost our father, she was allowed to come from Russia for the funeral. It's not that hard to understand. That in that moment, she was there to help me. She put me through school. She got me this job. She saw how agents were dying, and she sacrificed her men to bring me in and protect me. You don't do that if you don't care about someone. Felix wasn't having a bar of it. He refused to believe that Natalia's help was anything but family helping one another. She offered him a role in the Black Tusk after seeing how out of their depth the division was. She rescued him from what was looking like certain death. Before the main operation, Faye talks to Felix about escorting a VIP. Kestrel, get your team ready. Got an assignment? Nothing too big, just need you to escort a VIP. Babysitting duty? <sighs> Seriously, don't you have some grunts who can do this? Trust me, this escort is too important to leave to a rookie. Well now, you've got my attention. 
Given what we know about the Black Tusk at this stage, and who remains in their ranks, it's likely that this target is President Ellis, or someone of equally high importance to them. So they needed the right person for the job. Leading up to the operation, Felix discusses strategy with Viper. You ready for this? Absolutely. You don't mind not knowing who the target is? I trust Faye. And frankly, she's right. We've had too many leaks. She's smart to keep this one close to the vest. Do you know who the target is? I've got my suspicions, but I'm not going to speculate. I think it's Kelso. Okay, Sparky. Don't strain that big brain of yours. <laughs> Being young and eager, Felix is keen to get started on the op, but expresses confusion around the lack of intel. Viper trusts Faye and understands the reasons behind the secrecy. Unwilling to rock the boat, Felix accepts this and continues with his preparation. When instructed to do so, he set forth executing his part in the operation. Taking his band of BTSU, he started capturing locations of interest in the northeastern districts of Washington DC. Multiple sites were captured in Downtown East, Federal Triangle, and Judiciary Square. However, the division were hot on his tail and were quickly able to put a stop to his advancements. After taking back these sites, they were able to find his location. While Phoenix put up a somewhat unorthodox assault, the division was eventually able to push him back, taking down his BTSU guard and eventually eliminating him in the process. For the third target of the Season 4 Manhunt, we come up against a rogue agent going by the call sign, Magnus. What information will we find towards locating the Division's second wave acting commander, Fei Lao? Dustin Xavier, codename Magnus, grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. A true patriot at heart, he went on to join the US military to do his part in fighting for and protecting his country. During his second tour in Afghanistan, his unit was struck by an improvised explosive device, and they were ambushed shortly after. After showing extraordinary heroism during this incident, he later received the Valorous Unit Award. It was at this point that he was approached by the SHD and recruited shortly thereafter. However, it wasn't long before he started questioning how well prepared the division was with their mission. Xavier, or Xavier, or Javier? Xavier. Thanks. It annoys me when people don't know how to say Lao, but have no problem with McGuire, McMahon, O'Shea, and Kavanaugh. Fisher, Schneider, Muller might have something to say about that. Your CO is German, right? Very. Third generation. Kept assisting his family was never Nazis, which, you know. <sighs> the more you protest, the more likely you are exactly that thing. Boys, let's show the lady what she's won. Your unit in Afghanistan. Yeah. You got hit by an IED. It happens. Any residual trauma? Just the normal. Gotta make sure it wasn't for nothing. That's how they got me. Just in case. We need you to join us. Just in case. Most likely you'll never be activated, but just in case. You survive the worst, you can handle this. No one can handle this. We're just here to minimize the damage. And hope there's something left when we're through. And if there isn't, we will be the ones to rebuild it. Looking forward to working with you, Magnus. He came to the conclusion that the recruitment process was more about getting numbers and ticking boxes, rather than being adequately prepared for such an event to occur. And this was only further supported when he witnessed the lack of equipment and resources allocated to agents, and how hugely insufficient it was to handle the crisis at hand. Not long after his activation in Washington, D.C., Magnus was approached by Barton Schaefer. You get it. We're the same. You're a patriot. You served your country same as me. We've seen what can happen when a weak leader rises to power. We have. And I know that we can't rely on the government to save us. This thing moves too fast. You have to be agile. The wheels of government roll too slowly for something like this. They're trying to use a scalpel when what we need is a sledgehammer. I can be that hammer. 
Magnus immediately recognized an individual with the same drive and objectives as himself. Someone who only wanted what was best for the country. So he would go on to join with the Black Tusk. Magnus would later be assigned to Fei Lao's unit of rogue agents, but his demeanor didn't exactly have him fitting in with the rest of the team. Magnus? Sup, Viper? Uh, gross. What? I just said sup. Yeah, I know what sup means. Hey, hey, you don't mean nothing. Unless you want it to mean something. Gross. Hey, you don't have to be like that. And you don't have to be a disgusting human being, but here we are. I hope you get eclipsed. Oh, 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 that's fucked up. I just said sup, and you wish that keener shit on me? You're cold, Viper. I thought we were friends. Being a soldier was all he knew. He was just there to do a job, and work with the side that he believed had the country's best interests at heart. He wasn't there to prove himself. He hadn't been impacted by the failure of the government or the SHD. He hadn't witnessed tragedy or lost anyone close to him as a result. He simply found a team that he saw was more aligned with his goals and were better equipped to handle it. However, some of the ways he approached certain aspects of the organization wasn't necessarily appreciated by his colleagues. He just couldn't seem to comprehend that he wasn't in the military anymore and his new comrades from vastly different backgrounds didn't seem to be overly fond of his banter and the ideas that he brought to the table. me your dumbass ideas my ideas aren't dumb who better than the people in the field the ones using the gear to tell you what they want and need out of the gear fine okay so like stay with me think about it think about what give me a second okay picture it you're out in the field you got hostiles on your right and left yeah so it's a tuesday you see an opportunity to run and slide into cover uh -huh. But there's mud. Yeah, some are in D.C. Lots of mud. Got it. And you've only got one pair of pants. So what do you want? What if your knee pads had quick deploy shin and hip guards? <sighs> you want my sister to make knee pads that have quick deploy sliding shin and hip guards so you don't have to wash mud off your pants? Yeah, think how awesome that would be. <sighs> yeah, <clears throat> I'm not calling her for that. When the time came, Magnus set forth executing his part in the operation. Taking his unit of BTSU, he started capturing locations of interest in the western districts of Washington, D.C. Multiple sites were captured in downtown West, Constitution Hall, and East End. But as has happened time and time again, the division were there to stop the rogue advances. The SHD were able to quickly and efficiently remove any trace of his movements in D.C., and eventually caught up to him. Taken by surprise, he put up a valiant fight, but was no match for the agents. Cersei is the rogue agent credited with converting Fei Lao over to the Black Tusk. So with this in mind, what more can she add to the story behind the former second wave commander going rogue? Alicia Coswold, callsign Cersei, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Although she didn't come from money, she more than made up for it with determination and dedication. Cersei is a confident, proud American citizen with an optimistic and positive attitude towards everything she sets her mind to. After doing a tour in the army, she took advantage of the GI Bill, a law that was introduced in 1944 that helps veterans with the funding towards education, including college, graduate school and other training programs. It was during this time that she was approached and then recruited by the division. After graduating college, Susie went on to teach English as a high school teacher and it was around this time that the dollar flu was first released into New York City. It wasn't long after she was activated that she realized that the division was hopelessly unprepared for the situation they were facing. As a strong patriotic individual, she believed that the SHD didn't have what it took to get the country through these difficult times. Cersei was eventually approached by the Black Tusk. Having already lost faith in the division, 
it didn't take much convincing to bring her over to this side. Sometime after the Black Tusk made themselves known to the Division and invaded Washington DC, Cersei was captured by Agent Fei Lau. I know you're working with someone. Ugh, careful, Fei. You don't want to make Isaac upset. He hit me like that again, he'll think you've gone rogue. You teamed up with the JTF. We do what we have to. You got a concussion? You're the one who isn't thinking straight. What's your mission, Agent? To save what remains? To ensure survival. That we live on. That when we finally get back on our feet, there is something left to stand on. Cool story, Faye. And how's that working out for you? It's hard. But we're stable. Sure. For now. What about next week? Or the week after? Or when you haven't had a Sarah delivery for months, and the medicine runs out, and the people who work together so well right now turn on one another? What are you going to do then, Faye? We will adapt. We will work together and find a way to move forward. And when they steal your tech and turn your turrets against you, what'll you do then, Faye? What I have to, Alicia. I'm doing the same. You're not there yet, but you'll see we're the same. I'm not like you. I'm not a traitor. I'm not a traitor. I'm effective. I can see where this is going and who can actually make a change. You'll figure it out eventually. Or you'll die. Either way, my boys will find me soon enough, and then you'll need to make a choice. What choice is that? To let me go. Or see if you're good enough to take on my team. Who are you working with? Still haven't figured it out. Thought you were better than this. I just want to confirm it. You scared? Never. You should be. We took out the LMB. I'm not afraid of Black Tusk. So you are as smart as you pretend to be. I'm a lot of things. You shouldn't underestimate me. Now, tell me about your first meeting with Schaefer. How do you know about Schaefer? Susie was surprised to learn that Faye knew of Barden Schaefer. Had she too been approached by him? Were they still in contact? Regardless, Faye eventually agreed to release her. Susie would regroup with the Black Tusk. Although she was the one being interrogated, Cersei had learned a lot from their interactions. She sensed a certain vulnerability, a degree of doubt in Faye's eyes. Cersei talked to Schaefer about the potential of a new valuable asset towards the Black Tusk cause. She get anything out of you? Nothing we didn't want her to. She gonna be a problem? Pretty sure she's an asset. You think she's ready? She's desperate. A little push and she's one of us. Is that a good idea? No one has better access to the Division than Faye. We bring her to our side, we'll know where all the bodies are buried. Then it's just a matter of time before they fall and we rise. Although apprehensive about the idea, Schaefer takes Cersei's feedback on board and proceeds with plans to entice Faye over to their side. Some time has passed. The Division has managed to locate and eliminate Keena's rogue agents, and eventually the man himself. And this is when it was made known that Fei Lao herself has gone rogue. I can't believe we're working together again. <sighs> Sorry about the black site. I get it. You didn't know what this was. You're right, I had no idea what this was. I'm starting to understand though. I'm glad you signed on. I always liked you, Fei. I like you too, Alicia. Use my call sign. Cersei. Makes it less weird. Alicia's too personal. Reminds me of life before this shit. Fair enough. You want a call sign for this op? No. It's better if I remember where I came from. Cersei confides in Faye, welcoming her to the team with open arms, forgiving her for a lack of understanding from their earlier interactions. But it wasn't long before Schaefer gave Faye her own team to work with, and one of the first assignments she gave out to Cersei was to get the location and schedule of President Ellis. What do you need? Just a location and schedule. Should be a piece of cake for you, Cersei. Whose location and schedule do you need? Chicken Hawk. That's need to know, Faye. You know that. I need to know. What do you want it for? Just need to make sure that he's not in any danger. Getting rumblings about transports and mobile units outside of DC going through Maryland. Just want to confirm that Chicken Hawk's not in any danger. 
Although suspicious of her reasoning, Susie gets her the information. Schaefer really knows how to pick them. Hey, he picked me. We're different. His original squad, complete fuck-ups. You're not wrong. How do you lose the Pentagon? How do you lose a bioreactor? You know, I can't... I still can't tell if it's incompetence or a leak. A leak? Someone on the inside leaking intel to the division. Why would you say something like that? Makes more sense than Wyvern losing the antivirals and random agents getting lucky. Wyvern wasn't stable on the best of days. For an elite squad, our comms should be secure. We shouldn't be having these leaks. Isaac's good, but he's not that good. There's no way that we should be compromised like this. Maybe someone programmed a backdoor into our comms relay, just pumping intercepted radio to some data analyst in a basement under the Lincoln Memorial. Makes sense. Viper, I was kidding. Jesus. You need to get laid. You're wound too tight. <sighs> you might be right. But I wouldn't let any of these chuckle fucks touch me. They're not exactly my type. Acknowledging the failings of Schaefer's original squad, Susie proclaims that this time is different, and when the time came, she set forth, executing her part in the operation. Taking a unit of BTSU, she started capturing locations of interest in southern Manhattan. Multiple sites were captured in Battery Park, the Financial District, Civic Center, and Two Bridges. But much like the many rogue agents the Division have come across in the past, they were able to stop the rogue advances. The SHD were able to quickly and efficiently remove any trace of her movements in New York, and eventually caught up to her. Cersei put up a tough fight. In fact, it took the agents a couple more attempts than I, the, uh, they, would ever like to admit to. However, in the end, she was no match for them, and was ultimately killed in the fight. Fei Lao was one of the Division's most trusted agents. However, her mission to avenge the death of her sister and rid the world of Aaron Kina led her to going rogue and joining the Black Tusk. But why did she choose to take this path and betray the SHD and her fellow agents? Fei Lao is a second generation Chinese American. When she was only 17 years old, she tragically lost both of her parents in a car accident, resulting in her being tasked with raising her younger sister, Heather, on her own. Records state that this changed her. Certain behavioural traits, including integrity, accountability, empathy, resilience, vision, and influence, were enhanced, resulting in strong leadership traits that would assist her in the years to come. However, this also came at the expense of her ability to gain and manage personal relationships. While attending City College, Faye joined the school's Reserve Officers Training Corps. She used this to help further progress her career. After a number of positions within military intelligence, Faye was eventually admitted into the National Security Agency, where she worked as a part of the support staff for the Director of National Intelligence. After the Presidential Directive 51 was signed, Faye relocated to the newly formed Strategic Homeland Division as a senior field officer. She would be reporting directly to the Northeastern Section Division Commander, Louis Chang. Shortly after the first wave of Division agents disappeared, President Waller activated a second wave of agents into New York City and ordered Commander Chang to personally lead the operations. Fei was activated to serve as Chang's second-in-command. But, as the helicopter was approaching its destination to pick up Fei and the remaining agents of the second wave, it was shot down and destroyed, killing Commander Chang and seriously wounding Fei. Her injuries meant that she had to be removed from field work. But, as Fei Lao was now the most senior agent in the city, she continued to serve as the acting division commander. From here, she was the primary contact and strategic support for all remaining second wave division agents in New York. Months pass. The division have made vast steps in regaining control of New York. All major hostile faction leaders have been killed, and a number of parts of the city were starting to rebuild. Furthermore, intel suggests that the first wave rogue agents have left the city, along with their leader, Aaron Keener. More months pass. The division's network was taken down and protocol dictated that all available agents must get to Washington DC as soon as possible. But Faye made the choice to stay in New York, 
to stop them from losing the foothold they've gained over the months prior. There is an attack on the southern Manhattan JTF outpost at City Hall. Agents from DC are sent to investigate. They learn that the attack was orchestrated by the rogue agent, Aaron Keener. It has now been over eight months since the majority of the division agents headed to DC, and Faye had finally recovered from her injuries. However, something else was coming, and this would see Faye's whole world come crashing down. A settlement in Hell's Kitchen District has been attacked by Rikers. With near to no defensive systems, and a dwindling amount of JTF to properly guard and patrol the facilities, there were massive casualties, including Faye's sister. Nevertheless, with help from the division agents from DC, she continues the hunt for Aaron Keener. It was around this time that Faye manages to capture a rogue agent who just happens to be working for the Black Tusk, Agent Alicia Coswold, otherwise known as Cersei. The following weeks would see the division locating and eliminating Keener's rogue agents, and eventually the man himself. But even more shocking was the revelation from New York's number one agent. Schaefer, do you read? Listening. Fall back. Keener's dead. But he's activated the network. What's the damage? Parnell's watch is collating the data. Looks like it's all of them. Shit. More rogue agents. Just what we fucking need. No. It's perfect. This will bring the division to its knees. And that's when we'll end them. Once and for all. Although still apprehensive of his decision to join up with the Black Tusk, Faye meets up with Barton Schaefer to discuss plans going forward. How's it feel? Comfortable. Lacks personality, though. Easier to spot a friendly in the field. The uniform doesn't guarantee you're a friendly. Fair enough. I like your style, Lau. No bullshit. I think you'll fit in well here. Me too. Do I get to build my team? Or are you testing me out with an established squad? Are you worried about getting hazed? I've had to break into boys' clubs before. I know how you like to test people. Finish this off, and we'll talk about building your own squad. Copy that. Over time, Schaefer was eventually hunted down by her former colleagues and captured. Faye took little time in organizing a meeting with President Ellis. This is our chance to shape history. I couldn't agree more, Mr. President. You said it yourself. Somebody has to step up. I'm willing to take on that challenge. If we're going to get this country back on track, we have to be willing to do things that won't be popular. I know that you and Schaefer had a rather contentious relationship. I hope our collaboration will be more efficient. I look forward to meeting you in person. That can be arranged. Excellent. See you soon, Mr. President. <sighs> what an asshole. After finding out Ellis' whereabouts and schedule, Faye caught up with him at Camp White Oak. And when the time came, without hesitation, she gunned him down where he stood. Meeting adjourned, Mr. President. It's done. At this point in time, division agents were already hot on her trail but she had already rang through, announcing that it was the division that had taken the president out. So time was of the essence. They needed to catch up with her before they too were announced as rogue. Chasing her through the compound, they eventually caught up with her in the area that Alice himself had once escaped their grasp. But this time they were prepared. Disabling the helicopter, Faye was forced to engage the agents head on. After a short fight, the division was able to eliminate her supporting BTSU forces. Although Faye certainly brought the fight, the SHD agents had no problem bringing the full force of their vengeance to the party. Let's face it, I haven't heard from a single person that wouldn't agree that this was a disappointing end to the manhunt. 
But based on the trailer and the sudden announcement from Massive that this was to be the last update to The Division 2, I think that this isn't the last we're going to hear of Fei Lao. I legitimately believe that we were supposed to capture Fei, similar to what we did with Schaefer. But due to the apparent unexpected decision to extend the division over the next year or two, they potentially cut the final cinematic to be expanded on later. This could also be further supported by the fact that Isaac never said anything of substance when she was dropped. But if Theo taught us anything, Isaac can be easily manipulated, so who knows. However, for now, let's look at the facts that have been presented to us in-game. Faye lost her sister due to inadequate JTF resource to look after the settlements. Faye captures and interrogates Cersei. Aaron Keener is killed, followed shortly after with Faye being found out as rogue. Barden Schaefer is captured by the Division. Faye locates President Ellis and executes him, blaming it on the Division. Faye is found and potentially captured by the Division. Then there is the last comms that we received from this manhunt that leads to the idea that Faye is working as an undercover rogue agent. I know. You hate me. You never trusted me. You probably never liked me and only moderately tolerated me. It's okay. That's okay. We didn't have to be friends. And I know you probably think I'm a bitch, though you would never actually say that. Not to my face, at least. I think the reason we never really got along is we're too similar. We're stubborn, we care too much, and frankly, we're both pretty guarded people. We've both lost people. And we didn't deal with that as well as we could have, I guess, but I hope that when I'm done, you'll understand why I did what I had to do. I don't expect you to agree with it, but I hope you understand. I'm not sorry it went down like this, but... I'm sorry I couldn't tell you why. Hey Roy, this is hard for me. This is probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. You trusted me and I loved you for that. It broke my heart having to keep secrets like this from you, but I knew, I knew if I told you what I was planning, you would try to stop me. And if you tried to stop me, there was no way I could have gone through with any of it. There's no way I could have interrogated Alicia, or met Schaefer, or gone with him. But I had to do this, Roy. I had to. We were losing. We lost the authority. We lost the trust of the people we were trying to protect. Without trust, we have nothing. It doesn't matter how many good or bad things we do if no one trusts you to get the job done. And with Schaefer and Ellis, we lost the legitimacy. We lost the ability to say we are on mission. Hell. The only one who agreed we were still on mission was Isaac. I knew what I had to do. All I needed was access, and I couldn't get that unless I joined them, or at least unless I could make them believe I joined them. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you why. I'm sorry I had to break your trust like that. But I hope, I, I pray, you'll forgive me someday. If you don't, I might have to come haunt your ass until you do. Low out. Though, if this is true, and she is simply going through all of this to take down the Black Tusk asset, President Ellis, why did she blame his death on the Division? This leads me into two different trains of thought. Ellis is the one responsible for having the JTF abandon the quarantine zone not long after the initial outbreak. This in turn led to many Division agents going rogue, with one notable agent in particular, Aaron Keener. Faye blames Keener for his part in the death of her sister, and Ellis's part in putting Keener in that position. The Division is the last organisation with any ties to the old government, giving them claim to determine what's right and wrong. It's no secret that Faye isn't a fan of the way that Isaac operates, but considering everything that's happened, perhaps Faye has finally lost hope in the government and the SHD too. She has come to the conclusion that the Strategic Homeland Division is a failed initiative, and that with all the freedom they are given, they still don't have enough wriggle room under the guidance of Isaac to do what is needed. I don't necessarily think she believes that the Black Tusk are the answer, but now that Schaefer has been captured, she decided to seize the opportunity and kill two birds with one stone. 
she would execute Alice and bring down the SHD. As witnessed in Warlords of New York at the Haven Settlement, trust in the division is already pretty low. The general public is sick of watching these agents do what they want and eventually turning rogue and working against them. With Faye blaming the death on the division, that should be enough to push the remaining settlements over the edge, and without the support of the people, the agency would collapse. This would basically put the division agents in a position of becoming rogue agents. Whether Isaac has flagged them as rogue or not is redundant. In the eyes of the people, they are no longer allies put in place to save what remains. However, I don't think having each of the agents hunted down and killed is what Faye actually wants. This is likely just a side effect of what she has done. She may have just deemed this as acceptable collateral damage in her mission of putting the final nail in the coffin for the old US government and the SHD. In fact, maybe she was hoping that they would regroup with her later on, no longer under the SHD control. Alternatively, the second and probably my preferred direction Faye hasn't lost hope in the government, and she still strongly believes in the Division's mission of saving what remains. But over time, watching this determined and well-funded new enemy, and the remaining agents around her either being killed or turning rogue joining the Black Tusk ranks, she has come to the conclusion that they are fighting a losing battle. The only one left in the government is corrupt, and has joined the other side. The chain of command is already broken. It was up to her to take him down before he was used to bring the general populace over to their side. Faye would go undercover and eliminate Alice after gaining their trust. She had to do this alone. Firstly, she didn't know who she could trust anymore, and those she could, like Benitez, wouldn't allow her to do this on her own. But she had already lost enough loved ones, and didn't want to be responsible for more of their deaths on her hands. The reason she blamed Alice's death on the division agents was to keep her cover from being blown, after all, Schaefer had already been captured, but Natalia Sokolova was still out there, and while she was still around, the Black Tusk are a threat to the country. Yes, this means that the division has now been burned, but as she had seen them as only losing ground to this invading force, it was a sacrifice she had to make. On top of this, given that they are now rogue agents, she may be able to bring more of them undercover into the BTSU to help in her mission, especially once Benitez and Rhodes receive her message. Faylau decided that it was up to her to do what no division agent was able to, and that the only way to do this was to go rogue, join up the Black Tusk, and take Ellis and the rest of its leadership down from the inside. Seasons 5, 6, 7 and 8 are just repeats of seasons 1 to 4, but not in the same order which is a little bit weird. The only reason I'm including this section in the video is to explain why the content I'm about to run through jumps from Season 4 to Season 9. Well, it looks like the True Sons are getting bolder under their new leader, General Anderson. He used to be a strategist for Ridgeway, and it looks like his ambition has reached new heights. He's smart. They're keeping him at a secure location. We're getting reports of five of his true sons moving on DC. Major Castillo, a civilian turned true son. Castillo's background is in engineering. He's been taking over radio frequencies and broadcasting these rants that, frankly, if you didn't know better, could be quite the recruiting tool. Sergeant Daniels, this woman is a piece of work. We're getting reports of her indiscriminately assassinating civilians in the street. She's on a rampage. We've also got a logistical nightmare on our hands with Lieutenant Chang. His background and experience has shored up the True Sun supply lines and weapons. We can't afford to let him build their stockpiles. Then there's Major Xander. She has some anger management issues. Xander's been torturing and interrogating civilians. I don't know what she's hoping to learn from them, but we can't allow her to carry out this inquisition. And, last but not least, is Captain Lewis. We haven't actually seen him in DC yet, but we've intercepted comms that imply he and General Anderson are planning something big. Agent, you know what to do. Malcolm Castillo was the senior engineer at the Pentco Fairview nuclear power plant. Expecting his first child with his wife Sharon, the prospect of the future was both exciting and daunting. 
He'd always been very particular about how things should be done, and when it came to preparing the house for the arrival of their new baby, this was of no exception. Castillo had a plan, and this would be one of the major contributions he could actually do for his expectant wife, and he was eager to get started as soon as possible. So for the sake of their marriage, and to avoid any more unnecessary stress, Sharon had decided that at five months pregnant, it would be a good time to visit her family in New York. This would also be one of the last times she would be completely child-free, and a Black Friday shopping spree with her sister in Manhattan sounded perfect. The plan was simple. She was to spend two weeks bonding with her sister, while Castillo focused on getting the house ready. Unbeknownst to her and the multitude of shoppers on Black Friday, a deadly virus known as the Green Poison had been released. And sadly, while out shopping, Sharon too contracted the virus. Assuming that it was no more than just the flu, she refused to seek treatment. Her main concern was that the doctors might prescribe her something that could harm her unborn baby. Ten days later, at a clinic in Brooklyn, Sharon died. Utterly broken and grieving the loss of his wife and unborn child, Castillo immersed himself deeply into his work in the hopes of keeping his mind busy. Eventually, he moved himself into the facility to ensure that the plant remained functional at all times. As the pandemic continued to progress, the National Guard was ultimately sent in to protect the compound, and in order for Castillo to remain on site, he would have to enlist. Even after completing basic training, his primary objective still remained the same. As the on-site expert, he was to continue in his role of keeping the power plant safe and operational. However, always there and in the back of his mind, he believed that Sarah, the JTF, the government, and in turn the division, were all heavily responsible for what happened to his family. He held the belief that there was no way possible that they were unaware of Amherst's plans, and that they simply just allowed it to happen. Anderson, who was a logistics officer to the leader of the True Sons, Antoine Ridgway, was successfully able to tap into Castillo's grief along with further heightening his mistrust of the government. By using Castillo's anguish and genuine experiences to express his deepest heartbreak, Anderson was able to convince the National Guard to abandon their post, and thus allowing the True Sons to take control of the plant. Nice to meet you, Castillo. I've heard great things. Wish I could say the same, Dusk. Excuse me. I don't care if your watch is red, your division. And now you're working with the Black Tusk. I can assure you, I'm a true son. Then why are you still wearing that garbage? The best way I can support the true sons is to take advantage of the existing infrastructure. I thought that was something we had in common. You're smart. So are you. And we are specialists in our fields. As long as you are loyal to Ridgeway, to the cause, I promise to keep you safe. You really are a true son. I am. Now, give me the tour. I've never been to a power plant before. Do I need to wear like a lead-lined suit or something? Only if you go near the reactor or your radiation meter goes into the red. But that won't happen. Lynette Edwards, codenamed Dusk, was a third-generation Marine. Shortly after her first tour, she was recruited by the SHD. After the outbreak, Dusk was activated in Washington, D.C., but it didn't take long for her to come to the conclusion that the institution was corrupt. In fact, she was finding herself more and more aligned with the true son's way of thinking. Eventually, she decided that enough was enough. She turned rogue and joined up with the true sons. When the true son's leader, Antoine Ridgway was eventually hunted down and killed by the division. Dusk went on to continue Ridgway's work with a group of true sons who were devoted to his cause. Unfortunately, the attacks had left them weakened and short on supplies. She would do whatever it took to help her new family. Dusk would use her contacts to gain a connection within the Black Tusk and offer a trade in return for food, water, and weapons. Barton Schaefer would get in contact. She explained the situation that her and the True Sons were in. Supplies were critically low, and that they didn't have enough weapons to go around. Barden agreed to the request of assistance, and made a deal where they could work together. With all of this happening, Castillo would keep on working tirelessly to keep the power plant operational, 
while also continuing to obsess over the events that led to his wife's death. Castillo, we've been having rolling blackouts. Everything stable with the grid? Nothing is stable with the grid. Everything is old and failing. That's comforting. Should I be looking for a fallout shelter? Everything is stable with the reactor. The reactor and the grid are two separate things. Trust me, if the reactor failed, you'd know. Oh, well, you're the expert. Your local power supply has nothing to do with our work here. If you're having rolling blackouts, brownouts, or unstable power, you're gonna need to send someone down to the relay stations and transformers and see if they need maintenance. I'll see if I've got anyone who knows that infrastructure. And good luck. Start with ex-public works employees. Or, I guess, raid the Secretary of the Interior's office for a map of the power stations. You're funny. I'm serious. Go to City Hall. They should have schematics for all of this stuff. It should also be online. Your precious Isaac should have all that data. You should be an agent. I'm happy being an engineer. I don't need to play sheriff. It's probably squatters. Someone taps into the line, doesn't know what they're doing, and fucks up the whole system. You'll need to check the stations. Then you need to send the exterminators to take care of the rats chewing on the wires. Should be like riding a bike for you, Agent. After some time had passed, and the leader of the True Sons, Antoine Ridgway, was killed by the Division, and then Dusk, during the Barton Schaefer manhunt, General Anderson would step up and take the reins. Anderson had ambitious goals for the True Sons and planned on expanding their reach far beyond Washington DC. It was around this time that Castillo had decided that it was time for him to put down his work and investigate further. He wanted to go into DC to find out more and who was responsible. But without him on site, there would be no one to run the power plant. So Anderson made a deal with him to train up True Sons members to work in his place while he was gone. How are the new recruits doing? Great. We've got four shifts, ten people per shift. Forty skilled prisoners trained and ready to operate the reactor in case anything happens to me. Each shift has a True Son at the helm to keep them in line and train any future replacements, and each of them has two backups. We're set for the worst case scenario. And the best case. Best case? If we want to expand our operations, we have the opportunity to build a mobile team to take control over another reactor. The infrastructure, design, and basic mechanics are similar enough that my crew should be able to figure out how to keep the lights on. That's excellent news, Castillo. Thank you, sir. About that favor... You've more than earned it. Transpo's on their way. You will have a squadron at your disposal. Good luck in D.C. I hope you find what you're looking for. Thank you, sir. After training enough true sons to run the plant, General Anderson rewarded his dedication by sending him to Washington DC to investigate Sarah and the division's role in his wife's death. But Anderson had ulterior motives behind this gift, having already used Castillo's speaking talents to gain control of the power plant without bloodshed previously. He saw a powerful propaganda machine that could be placed in the middle of DC. There, he could continue to bolster the true son's ranks, or at the very least, provide a much needed distraction. It was a win either way in Anderson's eyes. There is no reason that Amherst should have been allowed to release his poison on the world, other than some idiot with access made a choice. And the choice they made was to let my wife, Sharon Castillo, and her sister Carolyn Owens, and my daughter, who we were waiting to meet, to name. My child, who I will never be able to name because I will never be able to meet her because she was still inside of Sheriff when those monsters dumped their bodies into a mass grave in Central Park and set it on fire to contain the virus. My wife and daughter paid the price for their negligence. After taking back a number of strategic points of interest, Castillo and a group of True Sons would eventually be tracked down and confronted by Division agents at the DCD headquarters. There, he would face off against the Division agents, eventually being brought down and killed. Michelle Daniels. Her great-grandfather was a proud Confederate soldier. Her grandfather, an army man. Her father, an army man and her brother, an army man. A proud and male-dominated family 
with deep roots entrenched in patriarchy and service to their country. The loss of her mother during Daniel's birth meant that she never truly had a maternal figure to help advise and guide her while growing up. Maybe the softness of a mother could have shaped her differently, made her gentle and possibly even meant a different path in her life. Yet irregardless, she grew up tough. She had a hardness about her that even the boys lacked. She was gritty, callous, and at times indifferent and cold. Taking a life was easy. There were never any regrets. And why should there be? It was her right. She was an apex hunter. Others noted with alarm her seemingly dismissive nature in regards to taking a life. When she fished, when she hunted, and that sharpening her rifle skills was more important than anything else. Yet her father always insisted that Daniel's demeanour was just the result of not having a mother, growing up around a multitude of males, and adopting a tomboy attitude in order to survive. Contradictory to her father's efforts in stopping the rumours, Daniels never felt she needed to justify herself. Her attitude had always served her well in the past, and this proved successful in the army as well, and she took immense pleasure in testing and pushing the boundaries of new recruits to see if she could break them. Unsurprisingly, her actions were noticed by her superiors, and as a result, she was repeatedly written up for objectionable behaviour unbecoming of an officer. After serving in one tour, she returned back to her life and hometown as a civilian. There, she began to work for her father in his tackle shop and hosting guided fishing tours on the Potomac River. Unsatisfied and discontented with this lifestyle, a year after leaving the army, she enlisted with the National Guard in the hopes of finding some excitement and to stave off further boredom, while also continuing to work as a river guide. With the outbreak of the deadly virus, the National Guard was activated in Washington, D.C., and she, like so many others, would eventually be merged into the JTF. Anything and everything necessary to save what remained, Daniels was undaunted by the task and ready to get to work. But eventually she became aware of Antoine Ridgway, his ideals, and his loyal men, the True Sons. This was the moment she had been training for. Finally a leader who wasn't afraid to do what was necessary, someone she could admire, who would appreciate her strengths and recognise her indifferences towards others and death to be assets rather than liabilities. Not long after Agent Dusk defected from the division, she met Daniels, and they would become strong allies and friends. After Antoine Ridgeway's death, when the True Sons were demoralised, broken, and severely short on supplies and weapons, Dusk made contact with Schaefer to negotiate the terms of him providing the True Sons with support. Nervous about going to meet him alone, Dusk reached out to Daniels for backup. Dusk to Sergeant Daniels. Come in, Daniels. This is Daniels. What can I do for you, Dusk? You free tomorrow? Not really. What do you need? I've got to meet with Schaefer. He didn't show for the last one. Something feels off. Could really use someone I trust to have my back. Oh, I thought you wanted alone time with your boyfriend. Gross. Gross. I don't know what Faye is thinking working with him. I don't know if I could trust this guy. Ah, uh, he's Black Tusk, but he's a Boy Scout. We talking about the same Schaefer? You want that backup or not? Better safe than sorry. I can't make it, but I can lend you a couple of guards. Thanks, Daniels. I owe you one. Mm, more like 20. In order to get the food and the equipment for her true sons to survive and rebuild, Dusk would have to join Schaefer on an operation he would soon be carrying out in DC. Dusk and her guard of true sons were to run point in the southeastern districts of the city, capturing multiple sites of interest in East Mall, Southwest, and Capitol Hill. But ultimately, this was a suicide mission, merely a distraction. Dusk and her accompanying true sons would one by one be hunted down by the division and eliminated. And eventually, even Schaefer would end up being captured on Coney Island. Daniels took the loss of her friend very hard and demanded revenge. So she approached General Anderson for orders on how to proceed. General Anderson, status report. Division took Dusk off the board. That's too bad. We need to counter-strike. Uh, negative, Daniels. But she was one of ours. She was a true son. 
She was a rogue agent first. She was one of us, but she was also one of them. And with loyalties as fluid as Dusk's, there's no way to know if she was playing her own angle. No, 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 no. I sent my men with her. And in time, we will avenge them, but not today. We need to see how this plays out. Schaefer's to blame, General. We don't know that for sure, but I will look into it personally. We can't keep working with the Black Tusk. <sighs> They're a liability. You may be right. There are too many rogues in their organization. Who knows what they're really planning? And with Ellis in their pocket, proceed with caution. General Anderson simply brushed this off as an acceptable loss. To him, Dusk was a turncoat, and would have more than likely done the same thing to the True Sons when it suited her. Yet he did agree that working with the Black Tusk was potentially the wrong direction going forward. After the death of Fei Lau at Camp White Oak, Sergeant Daniels was sent by Captain Lewis to Washington DC as part of his specialized team. There she seemed to be looking for something, as reports indicated a multitude of civilian interrogations acted out by her personally. But it would seem she wasn't getting the outcome she needed. General Anderson? Yes, Sergeant Daniels, how can I help you? Captain Lewis said I should talk to you. I want permission to use advanced interrogation techniques. Sergeant? I know that if I can push them a little harder, I can get them to tell us what they know about the hunt. You don't need my permission to do what you feel is necessary. I trust your judgment. Thank you, sir. If your methods produce results, that's all that matters. Oh, I'll get the answers we're looking for. Thank you for being so thorough. A true son leaves no stone unturned. We'll root out these snakes. Anderson was happy to oblige especially if it would get the results that the True Sons needed. However, these are the actions that would put Daniels on the Division's radar. Agents would catch up to Sergeant Daniels in Downtown West, where she and her True Sons had set up a stronghold, capturing strategic points throughout the district. One by one they were taken down, and at the bank headquarters, Division agents and Daniels met face to face. Although she was well defended, and her troop of True Sons fought hard, the agents were able to persevere and fight through, and eventually take her down. Mackenzie Chang is a third generation Chinese American who was born and raised in Washington DC. His father and his mother's father were both in the Navy, and so, like them, Chang too wanted to follow in their footsteps. Enlisting at 18, he soon discovered that it wasn't the right fit for him. He hated the water and found the Navy and their rules were not to his liking. He ended up being placed in the ground transportation team and there he felt his time and skills were being wasted. Eventually things came to a head when he got himself involved in a bar fight and as a result he broke his arm and three ribs. With a year still left on his contract, his family were able to pull some strings and fortunately for him, they were able to get him an honorable discharge from the Navy. He returned to civilian life and got a job as a museum security guard within the local mall. Yet, he soon realized that being a security guard at the museum was not as exciting as he thought it would be and began to miss regular combat trials. He endeavored to get some of that adrenaline rush back, so he tried his hand at airsoft and hunting. Yet these two, also lacked the luster he was after. Finally, he joined the National Guard in hopes that this would bring some of the action he was longing for. When the National Guard was eventually called on to secure the mall against peaceful protesters, Chang saw this as an opportunity to use his previous knowledge and expertise as a mall security guard to set up the perfect perimeter. General Anderson was impressed by the initiative Chang showed and immediately took him under his wing in logistics. Not long after the death of Antoine Ridgway, Anderson gave Chang his own unit. However, he denied him the promotion that Chang so desired in becoming captain until he could prove himself as a worthy leader. Chang is unwavering in his determination to demonstrate that he is deserving of the leadership role and ready for the title of captain and the admiration of General Anderson. General Anderson, 
I just wanted to send my condolences about Dusk and her team. Thank you, Schaefer. Moving forward, is there someone else you'd like me to work with? That won't be necessary. The Division has control of your supply routes in D.C. How do you think you'll survive without our assistance? Well, Lieutenant Chang has more than enough experience organizing transpo and supply drops. We no longer require your services as a glorified errand boy. I think you're making a mistake. I've only made two mistakes in my life. The first was trusting Lao. The second was letting her bring you into our operation. Good night, Schaefer. After Agent Dusk's death, Schaefer would get in contact with General Anderson. With everything that had gone down, they were no longer willing to work with the Black Tusk. Rogue agents, hunters that seemed unable to be controlled, and a leadership who were working under their own hidden agenda. Anderson decided that it was no longer in the True Sun's best interest to be working alongside them. Anything they had gained from working with them was more than being made up for by the work Lieutenant Chang was doing in logistics. Barden Schaefer would leave a message with Natalia Sokolova to update her of the situation. Natalia Schaefer, just got off the horn with General Anderson. He's decided Black Tusk supplies and assistance are no longer required. The True Sons are on their own and any tentative peace we may have brokered has been severed by the death of Lynette Dusk Edwards. I'm not comfortable working with the Hunters. This arrangement is creating more problems and we are losing allies. This is not why I joined the Black Tusk. Schaefer voices his concerns. He explains that Agent Dusk's death seemed to be a large part of this partnership breaking down, but that the Hunters are his biggest problem. They can't be trusted. They're jeopardizing the mission. This is not what he signed up for. Schaefer would eventually be contacted by Lieutenant Chang. Schaefer, this is Chang. Come in. Good to hear from you, Lieutenant. You change your mind about working together? No. So this is a social call? Dusk was a good woman and a damn fine soldier. I know. She was going to meet you and you got her killed. You know that was beyond my control. You weren't even there. You left her to die. You're right. I wasn't there. We've run into some complications. What kind of complications? There was another player on the field. What the hell are you talking about? Those division agents weren't the only ones targeting her. You make it sound like she was being stalked. Or hunted. Chang just wanted to give Schaefer a piece of his mind, wanting him to answer for what he did to Dusk. Schaefer agreed that he had let her down, but that there were unexpected developments, that someone who had been brought in to help, instead, hunted her down. After Fei Lao's death, Captain Lewis sent Chang into Washington DC as part of a specialized team. His job was to re-establish the True Sun's transportation and supply chain in the area. However, after capturing a number of important locations in the Foggy Bottom District, he would quickly appear on the SHD's radar. After battling through Chang's countless number of True Sun soldiers, they would eventually catch up to him in the Potomac Event Center. With the division agent's superior training, it wasn't long before Lieutenant Chang, like so many before him, was eliminated. Amanda Zander only wanted one thing in life, the opportunity to become a police officer. It's all that she had ever really dreamed of, the desire to uphold the law and an eagerness to bring justice and order to the people. She possessed a high level of dedication and skill in her work in the narcotics sector, and nothing felt better to her than identifying a potential target and hunting them down. Yet police work wasn't all that she'd thought it would crack up to be, as most of the time it was a waiting game filled with endless paperwork and copious amounts of cream-filled donuts. She knew she had to find other means of entertainment to make up for her lackluster career, so she joined a competitive shooting league. Yet Xander was still not content with her situation, she could be a dangerous person at the best of times, and especially when she was bored. She knew it, her family knew it, and recently, due to the use of excessive force on a perpetrator, now her superiors knew it too. Unsurprisingly, as a result, she was sanctioned. She was annoyed at herself, and she knew she had to get back on track and channel her impulsiveness into something else. 
there was still so much glory out there for her to grasp, and she knew that alarming her superiors so early on in her career was not the way she was going to get it. In order to help her direct her energy into something more constructive, her commanding officer recommended that she sign up for the National Guard. The hope was that the intense training schedule, strict rules, and very little downtime would help curb her impulsive and trigger finger nature. However, a month later, the devastating green poison was delivered onto the unsuspecting shoppers of New York City on Black Friday. And from then on, everything for Xander would change. She, along with a number of other personnel, were placed on active duty with the JTF, and it was here that a man by the name of Antoine Ridgway would become her commanding officer. Here in this environment, Xander's psychopathic traits of antisocial behaviour, lack of empathy, disregard for others, and narcissism thrived. Her callousness was praised, her impulsivity was considered charming, and her notable lack of guilt was an asset. Xander had finally found her place in the world, working for the future leader of the True Sons. During the events of the Barden Schaefer manhunt, Xander, like many other True Sons, blamed Schaefer for the loss of Dusk. If I ever see you again, I will fucking kill you, Schaefer. That's a promise. I understand why you're angry, but we need to put a pin in this and focus on our common enemy. Agent Lau! I fucking hate that chick. I don't trust her. She's been on my list for a while. Not Lau. She's not the enemy. She turned you into her bitch boy. You should hate her. She has her reasons. This channel's not secure, but you should really talk to Lau. Fuck that. I'm not letting her get into my head. Schaefer has been discussing what's happening behind the scenes with Faye for a while now, and he appears to be on board. He now seems to be trying to reach out to others to help in this fight against the true enemy. Though Xander's stubbornness will require a different approach. What do you want, Douglas? <sighs> Just a friendly chat. This about your girlfriend? Who? Lau. Is that what this is about? You hate Lau because you think we're together? No. I hate Lau because that bitch got half of my squad killed in New York when the reservists were called up to maintain the quarantine. Oh. Well, good. I'd hate to think you were still pissed about how things ended with us. Doesn't help that you're sleeping with a traitor. Oh, okay. She's not a traitor. She's a good woman. She's been through a lot. We all have. <sighs> Just give her a chance. Meet with her, and you'll see. We can help each other. There's something bigger happening. <sighs> you two getting married? Would it matter if we were? Damn, okay, Douglas, you need me to go rescue your pappy from the White House. You gonna finally reconcile so he can walk you down the aisle? Is that the secret mission? Xander, focus. We need to work together if we're going to stop what's coming. Okay, fine. Set it up. I'll meet with Lau. Bridget Douglas, aka Viper, would later be a part of Fei Lau's team in the following manhunt. Viper was the only child of Charles Douglas, the co-founder of the Douglas and Harding Military Equipment Company, though they weren't particularly close, and after the outbreak, Charles now resides in the White House, acting as the range officer. Viper was an unactivated SHD agent, who instead ended up joining the Black Tusk, where she would later meet Agent Lau. Xander and Viper, having previously been in a relationship, opened up communications between Fay, Schaefer, and the True Sons, where they appear to be recruiting for a future operation. As a side note, I really must bring up the relationship between Faye and Viper. Although this isn't of any particular significance towards the story, other than linking all of these characters together, it's more that I've been getting a hard time at home from my wife, because she absolutely called it way back when the Faye Lau manhunt was going on. But I, uh, I didn't agree or include it in the video. I need to remember, the wife is always right. So, uh, yeah, my bad. Regardless, this recruiting attempt would end up being unsuccessful. Xander would inform General Anderson, who would then get in contact with Natalia Sokolova. But as we now know, Faye is out there working under her own agenda, so Natalia has no idea what he's talking about. Natalia? I thought we had an understanding. I understand you no longer wish to work with us, and our fragile truce is broken. 
I do wish you would reconsider my kind offer. And I wish you would reconsider trying to recruit my men to whatever clandestine bullshit you and Lau are cooking up. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Oh, don't play dumb. It's not convincing on you. If Lau is reaching out to your true sons, it is not on my orders. That's on her own volition. Or maybe it's your true sons that are reaching out to her. My troops are loyal. Who did she allegedly reach out to? Major Sander. Oh. Well, this is probably a personal matter more than professional. Have you seen the state of the world? No one has time for personal matters. Well, women like Amanda find a way to make the time. You don't have to worry. No one is trying to take her from you. She frankly would not be a good fit for the Black Tusk, even if she wasn't trying to cast herself as the victim of a love triangle. Just stay away from my troops. Certainly, General. Have a good day. And don't hesitate to call again if you need anything. Good luck managing Xander. Douglas says she can be a bit unstable. A little while later, after Barden Schaefer was captured by the division and Fei Lau was killed at Camp White Oak, Major Xander was sent into Washington DC with a team of true sons. However, after reports of her harsh treatment of local civilians started flooding in, the division was sent out to put a stop to her plans. On the eastern side of DC, they would catch up with Xander in the Judiciary Square district. After taking out a number of outposts being held by the True Sons, agents would find her hunkered down in the District Union arena. And while they would have loved to be able to find out what Xander was searching for, there was no chance that she would allow herself to be taken alive. So piece by piece, her True Sons soldiers would be taken apart. And in her final stand, she too would be quickly taken down by the agents. Frederick Lewis spent many a summer on the ocean, rescuing inexperienced tourists who had got themselves into trouble off the North Carolina coastline's unforgiving seas. With the help of his father's small fishing boat and the fact that he had spent the majority of his life on the ocean, Lewis was the perfect man for the job. He had always seen himself as a saviour and the best person to bring back those missing at sea to their loved ones. So unsurprisingly, at the completion of high school, he joined the Coast Guard and over the course of time, worked his way up into the prestigious search and rescue team. Eventually Lewis married, and at the request of his new wife, they moved to a homestead in Kentucky. With the property value of the old fishing shack ballooning, they were able to buy a large estate which consisted of 40 acres. Yet soon after, Lewis grew tired of playing the part of a farmer, and decided to join the National Guard, in the hopes of once again finding his true purpose. Though after all of his sacrifices for his wife's happiness, and moving away from the sea he loved so much, and attempting to live a less thrilling life for the betterment of their relationship, she was the one who started looking elsewhere. The young man they hired to help around the farm was the perfect candidate, and two years after their big move to Kentucky, she had an affair. When Lewis discovered the relationship, he was devastated. After everything he'd given up, he still wasn't enough for her. So he quietly packed up his bags, collected his faithful dog, got into his truck, and left. Lewis knew there was only one place he truly felt whole, the ocean. His father and the sea welcomed him back with love and open arms. Once there, he rejoined the Coast Guard and tried to rebuild his shattered soul. Yet his efforts would soon be undermined again, as not long after his return to North Carolina, the green poison was released. Sent to DC to help support the JTF, the impact of his experiences, including his failed marriage, led him to be cold, nasty, and unmerciful to those he was entrusted to lead and protect. Captain Lewis, we ready for homecoming? Just a few things to take care of here and I'll be on my way. Advanced team is already on location. Lieutenant Chang's delivered and we have more than enough supplies for the party. That's great news. When Major Castillo got to DC, he recorded some very emotional reports. We decided to make some of them public. No greater recruiting tool than a civilian who found purpose with the true sons. Careful, Captain. You keep delivering work this good? I might think you're after my job. <laughs> Not to worry, General. I hate the office politics. Working with the team, 
That's where I belong. Making sure the trains run smoothly and we all come back safe. That's where I know I can be of service. Leadership support roles and infrastructure. That's the work that fuels me. We need people like you, Captain. That's the thing about the Division. A bunch of lone wolves with no real infrastructure and alliances. They were set up to fail. Hire a bunch of specialists, train them to use another to solve their problems. This is what you get. You can't depend on someone and build trust if you only talk to them when you need something. People like that are unwilling to acknowledge their shortcomings or ask for help until they're already in trouble. This is why I knew following you and Ridgeway was the right call. He was proactive. He was willing to make the tough calls because he saw where the road was heading. And now that he's gone, we will finish the journey together and bring our cause to every state in the nation. Good luck in DC. Captain Lewis checks in with General Anderson to give him an update on how his team has been going in DC. Everything is running according to plan and he's ready to enact his part of the operation. But one thing is for certain, neither of them hold the division in particularly high regards, referring to them as a failed initiative, flawed from its inception. Status report. We are getting ready to take the network but there have been some unexpected roadblocks. Increased instability in the power grid, surges and blackouts, some data anomalies, insecure comms, and increased brute force attacks. Some of my men are reporting that they have seen some odd lights and feel like they are being watched. I thought the stress was getting to them, but the reports are coming from all times of day and from folks I trust. Major Xander is looking into it, but I don't know that our methods will yield the results we're looking for. Once in DC, unusual reports start flooding in. Xander was set forth in order to find out what's going on but Lewis doesn't expect her direct approach will provide the results they need. However, this doesn't matter for now. The target they've been hunting for has been found. Captain Lewis and his men set course and head there immediately. Lewis, what's your ETA? Should be arriving at the party by sundown tomorrow. Negative. I need you there now. We've got a location, there's movement. Looks like they are getting ready for an extraction. We need to head them off at the pass. Permission to take main roads and make a loud entrance. Permission granted. This will put us on the Division's radar. It was inevitable. Maybe this time they'll actually see what we've been up against. I hope you're right. Frankly, if they haven't figured out what's going on by now, I don't think they ever will. Lone wolves. They have no trust and no support network. You pull one pin and the entire communication chain breaks down. This is why we have contingencies. Send me the coordinates. I'll get my team there ASAP. The division caught up with Captain Lewis at the Jefferson Trade Center. But before the agents could enter, Lewis puts out a message over the comms. This is Captain Lewis. Black Tusk have taken Jefferson Trade Center. We need backup. Lewis, this is Kelso. Put down your weapons and surrender. The division will take care of the Black Tusk. It's not the Black Tusk you should be worried about. Have your team meet me inside. I don't trust this guy. Don't shoot him. I want to know what he's up to. Lewis is the last member left of his team, and he warns that it isn't the Black Tusk that are the problem, that there is something worse within these walls. Someone he refers to as the Recruiter. Finally. What's your status? Armed and ready, but the lone survivor of my team. If you want us to help you, we need you to secure the Shade Node. You don't trust me to have your back? I don't trust you to have my front. That trust has to be earned. Captain, defend the Node. We can take care of Black Tusk. Watch out for the recruiter. The what? Oh, you'll see. Trust has to be earned. Well, Kelso doesn't trust him, for now, the Agents and Lewis will be teaming up against this new threat. Unknown network detected. What the fuck? I lost you for a second. I thought maybe the captain took up the node. But it must have been some interference or something. 
rogue striker drone detected. Enemy comms reveal that Jack Bonnie is the one leading this operation and that this is some sort of test for him. You ready? Yes. Tell Bonnie to stop checking up on me. I know what I'm doing. You know this is a test, right? It's his test, not mine. I'm not looking for a promotion. That's why I'm checking up on you. The agents catch up with Lewis outside of the SHD node, where he has secured the area, stopping the Black Tusk from once again taking down the SHD network. Agent Kelso, the true sons have secured the entrance to the Shade node. Your comms are secure. Thank you, Captain. No problem, Agent. True sons know how to follow orders. you breathing that shit. Friendly fire my ass. Rogue striker drone detected. System malfunctioning. <laughs> You're not the only one with air support. System restored. After fighting through the hordes of Black Tusk troops, the agents would eventually meet up with Bonnie in the final courtyard. Although he had brought along a Marauder class quadcopter, the agents would slowly take it down. And with the unwanted help of Captain Lewis's DC-62 airstrikes, Bonnie too would be eliminated. seen that status before. What the fuck is going on here, Captain? You know nothing, Kelso? So, not friends. If you finally figure out what the hell we're really up against, you know where to find me. Knock it off with the yellow powder, or next time I'll have to kill you myself. Talk to your boy. You're gonna need our help. My boy? Who the fuck is my boy? I've got a weird one for you. After your run-in with Captain Lewis, Fred reached out to me to parlay. We were in the same unit before Ridgeway defected. Apparently General Anderson has had a change of heart since Jefferson Trade Center. He's realized he's no match for the division or the Black Tusk, and is now trying to build an alliance with their leader, Natalia Sokolova. She's sending an advanced team to work out the logistics. Matthias Trigg Schneider. Used to be a professor and consultant for DARPA before he was recruited by the Black Tusk. He's been working on alternative energy solutions for their operations. Sean Micro Clark, a former army mechanic charged with maintaining and retrofitting the Black Tusk's combat infrastructure. If you've ever faced one of their drones, you have Micro to thank for that. Sandra Chirpy Patterson. Chirpy was a sniper before Black Tusk recruited her. 
Shot for shot, she's racked up more kills in the army in DC than any other soldier. Chirpy is judicious with her brass, but rarely lets a target get eyes on her before she takes the shot. Mitchell Lucky Woods. I worked with some sailors from his squadron. They said as soon as they docked at Annapolis, he walked off the deck and onto a Black Tusk hovercraft. Guess those rumors about how he got promoted to Admiral were true. And last but not least, General Anderson, the new leader of the True Sons. Anderson is reportedly coming out of his hidey hole to finalize the negotiations and is headed to DC. This is our one chance to take him down. Agent, good luck. Trigg was born and raised in Copenhagen, Denmark. From early on, he was seen as a gifted child with a particular interest in mathematics. At the age of 12, he moved to the United States to study at MIT. Aged 18, he graduated with a master's in electrical engineering and would become the department's youngest associate professor. His theoretical work on perpetual energy turbines eventually caught the eye of the Defense Department and he would be brought in to consult with DARPA scientists on several classified projects. But it wasn't long before his skills were noticed by others. Trigg would be headhunted and recruited by the Black Tusk private military company to find alternative solutions for powering their hovercrafts during off-grid and prolonged deployment operations. For the first time, we've now been given a visual of General Anderson. What is interesting to notice is that he is wearing General Antoine Ridgway's jacket. This speaks highly to his personality and intentions. The first moment he had, he grabbed Ridgway's jacket as a symbolic gesture to assume the mantle of control over the True Sons. Others would have proven their worth, or would have been the obvious choice as his successor, but Anderson obviously thought he needed this as further evidence to support his claim. Regardless, Anderson has now decided that the True Sons can no longer continue with their plans, not without the support of others. The Division and the Black Tusk have proven that the True Sons are no match, so Anderson reached out to Natalia to work out an alliance. However, given our last interactions with him, Captain Lewis is likely to have some issues with this. Lewis assisted us in taking down one of Natalia's operatives after his team was taken out at the Jefferson Trade Center. But for now, Lewis takes his orders and meets up with one of the Black Tusk operatives who are assessing the True Sun's position. I hope you're not still pissed about what happened at the Jefferson Trade Center. We were on opposite sides of a war. Can't fault you for seeing me as the enemy. What's your favorite geometric shape? I don't know. A, a triangle? Interesting. Practical, steady, strong, stable. One of the hardest shapes to break. A shape can tell you a lot about a person. Hmm. What's yours? Technically, it's a plain curve, but there's nothing more beautiful than a parabola. <laughs> you see a lot of parabolas in your line of work? Every time I take a shot. You don't think it's weird that we were shooting at each other last week and now we're supposed to be best buddies? I think it's weird the True Sons thought they could stop us. Better to get on board than get run over. Exactly. You really are a triangle. Division agents receive intel that Trigg is located somewhere in southwest Washington, D.C. After taking out a number of freshly acquired outposts held by the Black Tusk, they would discover that Trigg had been hunkered down in the Jefferson Plaza. The Black Tusk presence was heavy and they had well fortified the area, but the agents were able to slowly advance through the facility until they eventually met up with the target face to face. Trigg was prepared to have more than just a gunfight as he had explosive devices strapped all over his armor. However, these certainly didn't work in his favor. Before he had a chance to use them, a few quick bursts from the agents would cause them to detonate, stripping him of his armor, leaving him open to the final kill shot. As part of her assessment of the True Sons, Natalia questions the loyalty of one of Anderson's most trusted lieutenants. I'm worried about your man, Lewis. He's a pencil pusher. Nothing to worry about. He allied with the Division during Bonnie's test. Well, momentary lapse of judgment. Why are you protecting him? He's loyal. He knows where all the bodies are buried. He won't be a problem. If you're wrong about where his loyalties lie, at least he can tell you where to bury his body. But Anderson won't have a bar of it. Lewis is one of the good ones, someone who's been there from the very beginning 
someone he trusts. He would need more than a little speculation in order to act on such an idea. And that's exactly what Natalia would bring. Manny, hear me out. There's nothing to talk about. You chose to follow Ridgeway. You chose to let all those people die on Roosevelt Island. You're right. Those were my choices and I have to live with them. But it's not too late to make different choices. What the hell are you talking about? Can we meet? You were right. Lewis may be a problem. I'm glad you agree. You want me to, uh, take care of it? Not yet. Watch him. And see what he does next. Who better to lead you to the rat's nest than a rat? It would seem that whatever side Lewis is playing for, his options are now becoming pretty limited. As someone who's extremely loyal to the True Sons, they have now taken a turn under Anderson's leadership to team up with a regime that Lewis doesn't agree with. So at this stage it would appear that the Jefferson Trade Center mission, where he teamed up with the Division, won't be a one-off. I imagine the Division will be involved in rescuing him in a future mission, fully bringing him over to our side, potentially with other True Sons that are loyal to him. He can't be the only one who is unhappy with the direction that their new leader is taking them. On his 18th birthday, Sean Micro Clark enlisted in the army. After basic training, he was deployed into Afghanistan. Growing up, Micro was always very mechanically minded. He loved figuring out how things worked by pulling them apart and then putting them back together. In the army, he would rise to the rank of sergeant as a mechanic, but it wasn't long before he would have to take a leave of absence so that he could take care of his mother who had been diagnosed with cancer. Micro and his mother were very close and he would do whatever was needed in order to help her get better. Unfortunately, the medical bills were just becoming too much to manage. He would need to find a new line of work, something that would pay enough to cover the mounting bills and support his family. Jack Bonney would go on to recruit Micro into the Black Tusk. As someone with a strong set of ethics, this was a challenging decision for Micro, but given the position his family was in, he set his morals aside in order to help his family survive. Now for a quick word from this video's sponsor, me. You may have heard me mention once or twice that I recently started another channel. Now I'll be upfront and honest and say that this is not specifically a gaming related channel. Over the years I've had a lot of people ask for help around starting their own YouTube journey. And while social media influencing certainly isn't something that interests me, creating videos is. So I've created the space as a place to point people towards when they approach me, as somewhere to help them get started. As you can see, there isn't a huge amount of content up yet, as I'm just uploading when I have the time between my other two channels. But check it out if this interests you. Or if you'd like to show some support, I'd very much appreciate any subs and likes on the videos to help get the channel off the ground. There should be a link up in the top right corner now, but otherwise, let's get back to the video. I need more batteries, Vic. <sighs> I gave you enough for six months. You don't need more batteries, you just need to charge them. And how do you suppose I do that, Vic? Use one of the solar relays. Plug into the local grids, put up a wind turbine. Pick your poison. That takes time. Vic, we don't have time. Tell you what, I'll give you all your dead batteries and you can charge them while I blow up that hostile encampment to make sure you're safe. By hostile encampment, you mean that village by the river. A village armed with assault rifles, Vic. They're not a threat. I still got a job to do. And all I see is an armed threat. Make yourself useful and fix my batteries. You may remember this name from very early on when we were helping the theater settlement get up and running. The batteries powering their communication system were beginning to fail. Agents were sent to Odea Tech office to clear out the hyenas holding the complex to see what they could find that may be able to help them. Whoever you are, let me out of here! Ah! Ah! 
was an impressive performance. But I'm afraid I can't say the same for my own efforts. Thank you. The hyenas have been keeping me here to repair their gear. If you were hoping to find anything useful here, you're out of luck. Well, the battery packs we came looking for aren't here, but hey, you rescued a civilian and that's a victory. And who knows, maybe Mal could be able to help us out somewhere down the line. Let's call this one agent. Move out. After rescuing Vikram, he offers to assist the agents with locating some new battery packs. They agree to meet up with them at the Odea retail store. The basement beneath this store contains the battery packs you need, as well as the only computer in DC that can still connect to the Odea network. I need to access data on that computer. Get me there, and the batteries are yours. My key card no longer works, but I'm guessing you can bypass this lock. Battery packs are in the basement below us. Head down there now and we can both get what we came for. System purge started. Files deleted. Files deleted. Files deleted. Malik screwed us. At least you got one of those battery packs. But getting it out of there isn't going to be easy. You are so out by another route. Shit. Whatever he was trying to hide, he was willing to kill you to keep it a secret. But you survived. You got one of those battery packs. We'll send a team to pick up the remaining stock. With any luck, the theater's communication problems will be a thing of the past. As for Malik, 
I'm guessing he'll keep his head down for a while. So basically, the agents rescued Vikram. He offered in a way to thank them by helping them find the batteries they were looking for. But instead, it's a setup. The agents are ambushed by hyenas after he sets off an alarm, while he escapes, leaving them there to die. And up until now, we've heard nothing about him since. However, it doesn't sound like he's been having a particularly good time. He appears to have been picked up by the Black Tusk at some point, and they're using him to keep their equipment powered. Unfortunately for Vikram, the Black Tusk have now realized how much of a pain he is, and have reevaluated his importance to them, based on how useful he really is to their cause. Vikram Malik is a problem. Is Vic a problem, or are you concerned that he might be a problem? Concern. What did he do now? I think he's holding out on us. There's nothing left to hold out. Vic has served his purpose. Maybe it's time to let him go. Don't we need him to charge the Warhounds? Vic was always a temporary solution to an immediate problem. I'm working on something more... permanent. What do you want me to do with him? Whatever you think is right. I thought you said you were out of batteries. No, I said I gave you enough for six months. I never said I was out of anything. <sighs> You're an asshole. I know. Well... Now I really don't know what to do with you. What is that supposed to mean? I mean, the boss lady told me I could do whatever I wanted with you. Cut you loose, kill you, put you back to work. I was gonna kill you, but now I'm not so sure. That's great. Hey, you've done a lot for this organization. And I know we wouldn't have been able to get this far without you, so part of me feels like you've done your service and should be rewarded for that. And the other part thinks you just like fucking with me and making my day harder. So that makes me want to kill you. <laughs> You're not alone. Plenty of people want to kill me. I'm still here. Yeah? I don't think that means what you think it does, Vic. Having a lot of people wanting you dead ain't some kind of badge of honor. It means you're an asshole. Oh, I'm aware. Micro. See? Now the way you just said my name like that, Makes me want to kill you again. But you're a defenseless, unarmed nerd who sells batteries. Man, it wouldn't be a fair fight. It doesn't even seem right. Well, since I'm so defenseless and the world is so brutal now, why don't you just leave me at the next port and we'll see what kills me first? Starvation? Wild animals? Or one of my many enemies? <laughs> it's not a bad plan. Sounds fair. Sounds right. Yeah, I think she'll like that outcome. Division agents receive intel that Micro is located somewhere in Federal Triangle, Washington, D.C. Micro's forces could be found causing chaos all over the district. Public executions, controlling territories, the kidnapping of civilians, and setting up outposts in strategic areas. While sweeping through and clearing out all of the Black Tusk soldiers they come across, the Division agents would eventually discover Micro's location, the Viewpoint Museum. The compound was filled to the brim with countless numbers of drones, warhounds, and mini-tanks. In hindsight, the agents could have made things much easier for themselves if they had just used EMP skills. I mean, all the hints were there beforehand, but regardless, they managed to fight through. Micro had backed himself into a corner, and with their superior training and equipment, it wasn't long before the agents had eliminated him and his personal guard. This seems to be the season of targets with annoying voices so far, with Trig and now Micro. Speaking of which, I'd love to know the story behind his nickname. Vikram may have been snatched up by the Black Tusk long before the agents rescued him, or maybe in between the two side missions. But I actually don't think this was the case. He doesn't seem to have any allegiance to anyone but himself. As many told us before we found him in the retail store, he was dismissed from his role at Odea a few days before the outbreak first hit. He seems to have some other agenda, and not just the deleting of all Odea files that he blatantly did in front of us, something else. Something worth trying to kill the agents over. I'm not sure what it is, but I get the feeling we'll be finding out soon. It would appear that Micro released him into the wild, if I was a betting man, I would say that the Division will be picking him up very soon. And if that's the case, I hope we're given the opportunity to, you know, slap him around a bit. Because, God, he's a dick. <laughs> 
To the untrained eye, Sandra Patterson comes across as meek, dainty, and beakable, like a small delicate bird who in one swift move could be broken and easily discarded. Yet beneath the surface lies a cold, calculated, and psychopathic hunter with a brutality and disregard of life that has awarded her with the honorable title of the highest kill count of any Black Tusk member. A deadly sniper, she is an expert in fieldcraft, navigation, and stealth. She is intelligent and extremely patient, which makes for a dangerous combination when paired with her outstanding abilities and marksmanship. Known for preferring to actively hunt her targets at night, Comfortably perched in the vegetation high above her unsuspecting prey or deep in the shadows of a bush, she is roosting in her element, ready to pounce. Soon the nickname Chirpy was bestowed upon her, rumoured to be seeded by the way in which her victims never saw her coming and were only alerted to her presence when it was already too late. The chirp sound emitted as the lead bullet took flight through the silencer was the last conscious awareness that her victims retained before they were permanently eliminated. At the initial outbreak of the green poison, she was already on active duty with the army, and with the impressive body count that Chirpy had already racked up, she was obviously considered a highly valuable asset to a company like the Black Tusk, and so unsurprisingly, was nested into their organization soon after. I wonder if Chirpy games, and how she deals with fatigue at the end of the day. I mean, do you ever find that after a hard day of physical work in the mines, or construction industry or something? that you can barely lift your arms, and even the weight of the mouse is too much to take on, severely hindering your gaming time. Well, me either. But I don't exactly have the manliest of jobs, I sit in an office all day. The most strenuous thing I do is probably the walk from my car to my desk, but I still get tired, especially if I don't get my afternoon nap. Well, Logitech has taken the iconic G502 and managed to reduce its weight to an impressive 89 grams in the new G502 X+. But this isn't the only upgrade. The G502 has been my go-to mouse for the last several years. For me and my giant mouse-destroying hands, this sturdy beast has been one of the few around that has managed to survive past the first few months of use. So when they told me about the 502X+, Plus, I was pretty excited to try it out. Straight away I noticed the reduced latency due to the Light Force hybrid switches and an updated light speed protocol. This was actually more obvious than I was expecting. I'll admit it felt a little odd when I first took it out of the box as this mouse is just so damn light, but once I started gaming I very quickly forgot about this and actually really noticed the advantage of less drag, especially with the Hero 25K advanced sensor delivering the performance, power and precision we've all come to expect with the Logitech G range. And the new LED band? Oof. I've always said, if you don't have enough LED light streaming out through the window to light up the driveway enough to land a plane, you're doing it wrong. Anyway, a big thank you to Logitech for sponsoring the video. Leading on from previous targets in this manhunt, General Anderson is attempting to migrate the True Sons towards the Black Tusk, and now he is beginning to see the repercussions of this. I need your help, Natalia. Already? You were right about Lewis. He's not acting alone. And I'm worried we might have a mutiny on our hands. How many defectors? So far, uh, 10, maybe 20. Be patient. He's turning my men against me. If they are so easily turned, they were never your men. W what do you suggest I do? Be patient. Keep watch. Can you help me watch him? Of course. This isn't exactly a good look for Anderson, for a faction that is attempting to sell their case for why the Black Tusks should trust and take them on board. This only makes them look weak, as well as raising the question of whether he is suitable as a leader. Natalia and Anderson are now more than aware of where Captain Lewis is perched, but before acting on it, Anderson questions Lewis directly in an attempt to see where his loyalties lie. Captain, a word? What can I do for you, General Anderson? I'm concerned. What about, sir? Your commitment to the cause. I've never been more committed to the cause, sir. I hear things have been tense between you and Trigg. I wouldn't say tense. I just personally don't care for the man. What did he do to offend you, Captain? He didn't really do anything. He called me a triangle. That was weird, but I wouldn't call it offensive. He's just odd. And makes me uncomfortable. You seem to be uncomfortable a lot lately. I don't really understand why we were working with the Black Tusk. Yesterday we were killing each other, and today I'm supposed to trust Trigg to have my back? Do you trust me? Of course. Then don't worry about 
about the why, just get the job done. Give the Black Tusk whatever they need to secure this alliance. Copy that. Unsatisfied with Lewis's response, Anderson eggs on Black Tusk operative Chirpy, asking her to do what is required to remove Lewis from the equation and find out who else is involved. Chirpy, I want you to take Lewis into custody and bring him to Fairview. Do you want him to know he is in custody? What do you mean? I mean, I could bring him in and he could know he's being brought in. Or I could just bring him in and he will have no idea we are on to him. Ah, uh, handle but not control. Yeah. Sure. Maybe we can uncover some more rats. Exactly. Thank you, Chirpy. No problem, General. Yeah, out of curiosity, why do they call you Chirpy? Jesus Christ! Uh, thank you. I understand why they call you Chirpy. But before this could happen, there was one not-so-small problem coming her way. SHD agents would find out that Chirpy was active in downtown East, Washington, D.C. Chirpy's gaggle of Black Tusk forces have taken a large number of strategic locations across the district. Agents waste little time in fighting through the hordes of Black Tusk soldiers, breaking the outposts down one by one. Eventually they would learn of Chirpy's location, Grand Washington Hotel. The Black Tusk had well established themselves in this facility. Evidence of their occupation can be found all over the site. In classic Black Tusk style, there were warhounds and mini tanks fouling every turn. But the agents were able to fight through and would eventually find Chirpy in the ballroom, surrounded by guards. While her deadly pinpoint accuracy and super annoying drone proved unpheasant and a right burden, she was the very definition of glass cannon, and after a lot of attempts, once focused, she would quickly be taken down. This target leads a fairly linear story, only reinforcing what has been suspected with Captain Lewis and General Anderson up until now. Lewis has all but announced his future with the True Sons, under the leadership of Anderson. The decision to join with the Black Tusk has sent Lewis to question the direction of this once proud faction. With this target literally being asked to sort Lewis out, I expect in the next target or the main target to show Lewis either escaping the group or being taken into custody. But we shall find out soon. I don't know if I did something wrong, but there didn't seem to be any additions to the many Lewis comms in this manhunt target. So maybe we'll be seeing a little more in the next, or maybe I just need to nail gun Kelso to the basement floor the next time I see her so I can get the new intel. Anyway, because I'm a dad and I hold on to my god-given right and societal expectation to use dad jokes and puns, I have used exactly 25 bird-related words in this video, some more obvious than others. Frederick Lewis grew up in the ocean. When old enough, he joined the North Carolina Coast Guard, and over the course of time, worked his way up to the prestigious search and rescue team. After getting married, he and his wife would move inland, where he would run a farm. Due to the need for a little more excitement in his life, Lewis joined the National Guard. But when his marriage eventually ended, he wasted no time in moving back to North Carolina and rejoining the Coast Guard. Unfortunately, not long after returning, the green poison was released. When the Joint Task Force was established, his Coast Guard unit would be sent to New York to help the JTF in DC. Lewis would be placed under Colonel Antoine Ridgway's command, and when Ridgway stopped taking orders from above and started taking matters into his own hands, Lewis was one of the soldiers loyal to his cause who would free him from the JTF prison, then becoming the True Sons. After Ridgway's death, General Anderson would take the reins. Lewis would continue with his loyalties towards the True Sons. Anderson would eventually have Lewis carry out an operation in DC. They were hunting for something, and they have now found it. Lewis and his men head to the Jefferson Trade Center immediately. This is where the division catch up with him, except he is all alone, the last member of his team. Lewis and the division team up to take down the Black Tusk who have taken hold of the site, but while in there, they learn of an individual called the Recruiter, the target that Lewis and Anderson seem to have been hunting. Once the Black Tusk threat had been removed, and the recruiter had vanished, Lewis and the division parted ways. Not long after this operation, we would find out that Manny and Lewis had been communicating. Manny, what do you want, Captain? We used to be friends. That was before. 
before you joined Ridgeway. I thought I knew you, Fred. You do know me. Don't be like that. You killed people. This is war, Manny. We've all killed people. It's not the same, you know that. Whatever helps you sleep at night. What do you want, Fred? To help. Surrender into custody and we've got a nice cell ready with your name on it. I said I want to help. Being in jail doesn't help you. Not having to wonder anymore if one of my agents is going to punch your clock. That helps me. Access helps you, Manny. And I've got access. Manny and Lewis worked alongside each other in the JTF, all the way up until the day that Colonel Antoine Ridgway turned his back on the government after losing faith in their ability to do what was needed to make it through the pandemic. The JTF around Ridgway were faced with a choice. To fall back to the other JTF units, or to join this new band calling themselves the True Sons, becoming an enemy of the country. Manny fell back, keeping to his oath, while Lewis sided with Ridgway, agreeing that things needed to be done differently if the country was going to survive. Manny and Lewis weren't just colleagues, they were friends, so Manny took this betrayal pretty hard. How could someone he trusted so deeply make such a bad judgement call? The JTF is the combined forces of all the remaining police officers, firefighters, army national guardsmen and other civil and military branches. They are the good guys. What is he doing joining up with a group that is essentially the enemy working against them? But Lewis still feels that what he did was justified. However, under Anderson, things have now changed. He wants to help put a stop to Anderson and Natalia's plans. However, Manny is going to need a little more than just words to be convinced that Lewis is suddenly now interested in helping the right side. Any updates? Yeah, but I think it's better if we meet in person. You want an invitation to the White House? No. Pretty sure that would blow my cover. For all I know, you're doing recon for Anderson and this is a trap. That's why I wanted to meet. So I can stare into your eyes and know you're telling the truth. Mm, something like that. Where do you want to meet? Manny is still very skeptical, but Lewis assures him that if they meet face to face, he'll be able to help him understand that he really just wants to help. You actually came alone. Need to build trust. Have to actually keep your word. Right. You didn't come alone, did you? No, but for good reason. The intel I wanted to share with you is Wally. Nice to meet you, Manny. Apparently a person is intel now. We've met. We have? Yeah. DC protest crowd control back in December. Oh, shit. That's right. Oh, how's your uncle? Dead. How's your sister? Dead. How's my dog? Fine. Ransom's running around here somewhere. Well, that's something at least. What intel do you have, Wally? We've been maintaining a power plant. In Fairview? Yeah. A bunch of the engineers we want to defect. Anderson is making promises to the Black Tusk. We don't want any part of what he's planning. Manny and Lewis meet up in person. But Lewis hasn't come alone. He brings someone called Wally, who appears to be an engineer at the Fairview power plant. And like Lewis, she wants nothing to do with what Anderson is planning. Interestingly enough, Manny knows her too, so she must have been a part of the JTF as well. So I guess the big question here is, what is Anderson planning, and how does this involve the power plant? Not much has been said on Wally just yet, but I get the feeling we'll be hearing more about this character soon. There's more on our side now. How many more? A hundred? Maybe a hundred and twenty? That's too many, Fred. Anderson is going to suspect something's up. <laughs> He's too busy trying to impress Natalia. He doesn't know his ass from his elbow. I don't have an extra hundred beds, Fred. We're not ready to move yet anyway. But get ready. When we pull the trigger, you're going to have a new army at your disposal. That's what I'm afraid of. What are you afraid of? That your army's going to show up and my agents are going to shoot first and ask questions later. We don't know who we can trust. And if Anderson gets wind of a mutiny before you're ready, that puts all of you in danger. You're too cautious. And you're too reckless. Have faith. And get ready. Lewis proudly and excitedly announces that he has managed to find over a hundred True Sun soldiers who are willing to follow him in joining up with Manny, the JTF, and the Division. But he wasn't expecting Manny to react in the way that he did. Which is weird, I thought he knew Manny, the most panicky character in the Division universe. However, in this case, Manny is probably right to be concerned. How can Lewis really know and trust that many people? 
to know that they won't let this planned abandonment get back to Anderson. It could be due to someone attempting to bolster their rank within the True Sons, willing to work undercover and gather intel. Or someone could just slip up. Regardless, this is all moving very quickly, and Manny is the type to like a very solid plan in place before acting on anything. At this stage, he hasn't even alerted the JTF and the Division to what he's been organising with Lewis, let alone where he'll be able to house and feed so many extra bodies. Manny is probably being a little overcautious, but Lewis is definitely being reckless. An army of 100 plus ex-JTF, ex-True Sons will certainly come in useful, as the Division agents haven't had any real support for quite some time now. But this won't be enough to take down the Black Tusk and the remaining True Sons who stayed loyal to Anderson. So what is their plan? Will this force be tasked with taking down Anderson in the final manhunt, and whatever he's doing at Fairview Power Plant? The only individual in his squadron to survive on three separate occasions after operations went deadly, Mitchell Woods ultimately gained his namesake, Lucky. Though the rumours that he had obtained advancements by destroying his rivals was ever present, as he seemed to be indifferent towards the loss of the fallen men he had served alongside in the units. It was almost too convenient, their deaths, and with very little rivalry against him, he naturally progressed over time into more distinguished roles within the Navy. Before his squadron was summoned home in the wake of the Green Poison epidemic, having spent his entire career in the Navy, he had successfully reached the ranks of two-star admiral and Navy SEAL commander. Yet coming home for Lucky to assist with the outbreak was unbefitting to him. Why should he have to waste his time on people and tasks far beneath his status quo, when he could be utilised and appreciated by a far better cause and in so many other ways? To Lucky, the Black Tusks seemed like the superior alternative that he had been looking for, and thus he abandoned his ship almost immediately in favour of a Black Tusk hovercraft. As a result, the rumours that had followed him throughout his career were only strengthened after he abandoned his post. Lucky would reach out to General Anderson regarding the hyenas. General Anderson, I am pleased to inform you that all ties between the Black Tusk and the hyenas have now been severed. We will no longer be providing any logistical, supply, or weapon support to the hyenas. Without our infrastructure, they will fall into disarray, and it will be easier for us to take back the capital without interference. Thank you, Lucky. Please tell Natalia that I'm impressed by the Black Tusk's efficiency, and I look forward to collaborating with her more in the future. And the, uh, other thing? Consider it taken care of. I'll give the order for my men to grant you clearance at the docks, so you can assess our capabilities for yourself. This update would allow Lucky access into the True Sons, where he could assess their capabilities. But shortly after this interaction, he would contact a convoy called Roma 1 and reroute the delivery. Lucky to Roma 1. Change of plans. Reroute mothership delivery to Fairview. I repeat, Reroute delivery to Fairview. Do not proceed to 270. Stay on 70 and await further instructions. Ms. Sokolova, we've reached a deal with the Roamers. They've agreed to transport the supplies to Fairview, but they've run into some trouble in Virginia. What kind of trouble? Roadblock and hostile convoy. What do they want for their trouble? They would like us to sweeten the deal with a shipment of spice. Of course they would. Do you want me to handle the negotiations? That would be very helpful, Lucky. I have to get ready for my meeting with Anderson at Fairview. Tell them the spice will be waiting for them at the plant. They can pick it up as payment on delivery. So who are these roamers? I initially heard these comms and assumed that they were just Black Tusk with a codename. But when they made the request for Spice, this doesn't fit their MO. Spice is the hyena drug of choice, so they're likely to be hyenas that they are paying to run errands for them. So is Lucky and Natalia lying to Anderson, or is this just some sort of final job they're finishing out? I feel like this should have some significance, but I'm not quite seeing what it is at this stage.
agents would discover Lucky and his forces in East Mall, Washington, D.C. His Black Tusk had taken control of a number of high-value outposts across the district. Seemingly taken by surprise, the SHD agents fought through, recapturing the control points for the local settlements. Lucky's location would be revealed. He was holding out in the Air and Space Museum. The Black Tusk presence was heavy and well-organized. Agents would have to take their time, clearing wave after wave in each room they progressed through. Eventually Lucky would make himself known and slowly march towards the agents, wielding a minigun and heavy body armor. But like all heavy units, this armor was just fodder for gaining quick striker stacks and it wouldn't be long before the agents were able to pierce through it and eliminate him. With the final target now eliminated, General Anderson's location has now been revealed. He is at the Fairview Power Plant. But he isn't the only one there. Other than the hordes of Black Tusk, Natalia and Anderson have now acted on their suspicions around Captain Lewis. Manny, come in. Manny, this is Fred. What's wrong? They know. The true sons and Black Tusk are rounding up my men, taking them into custody. If they try to put up a fight, they'll execute. Can you get away? No. Wally? She was on a supply run. Good. Maybe she's safe. What do I do? Don't fight. Go with them. We'll find you. The plant. They were supposed to have a meet at the plant. We'll find you. Just don't do anything stupid. You know me. I do. That's why I have to say it again, Fred. Don't do anything stupid. Don't try to be a hero. Not today. Save it for tomorrow. Surrender today so I can be a hero tomorrow. So Lewis and his men have now been captured. This mission is now more than just about apprehending General Anderson. This is a rescue mission. Over 80% of all communities in the US rely exclusively on trucks to deliver all of their fuel, clothing, medicine and consumer goods. The Romans were some of the men and women who hauled these goods from state to state in their large freight vehicles. They transported materials, livestock, machinery, liquids, general freight, and sometimes hazardous substances. The hours could be incredibly long and in conditions that were often stressful, including poor weather and heavy traffic. Repeatedly, they were required to travel long distances, which meant spending many a night far away from home. Highly skilled in handling their large vehicles, they also possessed some basic knowledge of the mechanics of their trucks and how to maintain them. In the novel written by Thomas Parrott, The Division Recruited, the Romans were the ones identified as running the northern routes. In addition, they are now also in control of the Cumberland Gap Tunnel that carries the US Route 25E under the Cumberland Gap National Historical Park. The importance of this particular tunnel is because it represents one of the only safe ways for large vehicles to pass through the mountains between Kentucky, Tennessee and Virginia after the Green Poison outbreak. This passage passes through the Cumberland Mountains and consists of two separate bores which carry four lanes of traffic. Until recently, this tunnel was firmly in the hands of the non-hostile faction called Freites. But now, the Romers are the ones in charge. A rogue army of truckers using the might of commerce to seize control. Some people decided it was time to become the worst possible version of themselves when they realized the world was ending. And the Romers are some of these people. Essentially, they are smugglers, and they are aspiring to be the kings of the areas under their control. They bring much-needed supplies to people, but as soon as these same people become reliant on them, they've got them by the throat, and they hold on tight. Enslavement under any other name. As long as the ones they supply to follow their explicit instructions to a T, they will provide them with just enough to keep them going. And if they don't, if they dare to rebel against them, They'll take what they want anyhow, anyway, and destroy everything else. Their attire consists of leather, bandanas, worn denim, and boots, similar in resemblance to a classic motorcycle gang. The way in which the Romans act is also quite interesting, as they tend to carry themselves in a similar manner to the true sons. A lot of them have an arrogant and exaggerated swagger to their walk, and they love to gloat when they are victorious, and they know they have won. They have turned their trucks into weapons and have applied rough panelling to better protect their vehicles. 
These cargo carriers have been modified into improvised fighting machines, with guns mounted on them, and some are even equipped with machine gun nests and small artillery pieces. They also carry a variety of small arms, mostly SMGs and assault rifles, along with the occasional M40 rifle. General Peter Anderson believed with every bone in his body that he was an exceptional being and an extraordinary man. Yet in reality, this was just not the case. But oftentimes, the way in which a person of his egotistic mindset views themselves with such high regard can have a monumental impact on those around them. He sought immense value in establishing and maintaining closeness with those in positions of authority and control. Anderson was consumed with the idea of procuring high status for himself, and it's what drove him over almost anything else, and what fundamentally controlled a lot of his actions. He proved himself countless times to others that he was more than just a simple paper pusher, and served his country in the army, the army reserves, and the national guard. In school, he surrounded himself with charming, popular individuals in order to study how they were able to acquire that social currency after being mercilessly teased as a child for having a fixation on order and proficiency. Realizing that charismatic individuals are really interested in the process, he saw an opportunity to position himself as the man who knew where everybody was interred and how the system functioned, allowing the leaders to project charisma while he maintained the true power behind the scenes. Anderson can now use his years of research into the narcissistic mentality to his advantage, now that Ridgeway is no longer with them and the True Sons are seeking guidance. Anderson will take the True Sons nationwide, whereas Ridgeway's vision was always limited and small. He'll establish a network across the nation, portray Ridgeway as a martyr, and demonize the division using his death. I'm pleased we could come to some sort of arrangement, Ms. Sokolova. Please, call me Natalia. Oh, very well, Natalia. Cal speaks very highly of you, General. Uh, Peter, please. Very well. Peter. I'm sorry about all of that confusion at Bonnie's test. Oh no. I'm the one who should apologize. I had no idea our goals were so aligned. The trouble with Black Ops. You never know if you're secretly shooting at your backup. <laughs> That's true. I hope we can be more candid now. That's the other trouble with Black Ops. Candid is kind of outside the job description. I understand. Do you? Not really, but I will. I like a man who can admit when he's wrong. Well, you should be careful. You might fall in love with me then. You shouldn't try to be funny. It doesn't suit you. You don't want any stationary bases. I find my teams are more effective as a mobile unit. We would maintain the ground force and infrastructure, and you would run the trade routes and supply lines. Exactly. Think of your true sons like the skeleton, and we are the blood. We are critical to maintaining structural support. True sons will handle territory control, and Black Tusk, mobile support. We enhance one another's strengths to protect from external forces who would prey on our weaknesses. You're smarter than I thought. Well, thank you, Natalia. Peter, it's nothing. Anderson and Natalia discuss the finer details behind their alliance in one of the more awkward interactions I've heard in a while. It's clear that Anderson is out of his depth and that his position in this alliance is going to be placed heavily under Natalia's thumb. The True Sons will be placed on guard duty while Natalia's Black Tusk run operations. How is Captain Lewis finding his new accommodations? Fred is finding his quarters a bit cramped and inhospitable, but livable. And the rest of his friends? Some have retired. Most are enjoying similar accommodations. And a few have refused our invitation. How many is a few? So far, only one can be confirmed. Wally? Uh, yes, Natalia. Wally was on a supply run and has eluded our patrols. It's a shame she was one of our best engineers. No matter. I'm sure she will be easily replaceable. I look forward to getting the full tour as soon as you've cleared up your rat problem. 
so the soldiers that Captain Lewis had been preparing for the transfer over to the division had been rounded up and either locked away or executed. Rescuing Lewis may provide the opportunity to pull the remaining true sons, still loyal to him, out, if it's not too late. After the division had finished dealing with Natalia's Black Tusk operatives, who were sent in to assess the True Sons, agents would discover General Anderson's location at the Pentco Fairview Power Plant, where he had a meeting planned with Natalia Sokolova. When the agents arrived on site, Anderson was assigned a security detail by Natalia, who would be responsible for getting him safely to the docks, but also stopping the agents from rescuing Lewis. Running through various challenges, including EMP jammers that were set up in the laboratory, and rising steam pressure in the cooling tower, agents would make their way to the reactor. There, Lewis has been locked away in the office, while BTSU operatives activated a failsafe, setting the building on fire after deactivating the fire suppression system. Division agents were successful in turning on the valves and reactivating the sprinklers, rescuing Lewis in the process. But with little warning, Lewis took off in pursuit of Anderson. However, Anderson had already made it to the docks, where Natalia had arrived with hovercrafts. The agents would meet up with Lewis in the parking lot, where a helicopter was waiting to extract them. Agent Kelso to Captain Lewis. Go for Lewis. Need confirmation. Is Anderson in your custody? Negative. The Black Tusk have the general. I'll send a team to intercept. No, negative. It's not worth the risk. There's a fleet of Black Tusk hovercraft. This fog is the only reason why your extraction team is still breathing. Not that well. I don't think anyone does. We've only met once. She was not what I expected. Thank you and your boys for the assist. I look forward to working with you now that we're partners. She looks like the president of the PTA, but you can tell she's dangerous. Now there is the slight hiccup that the division took the plant. Uh, but I'm not concerned. They've most likely moved on to their next assignment. Nothing she does is random. She raises her eyebrow at dinner in Monaco when you're hearing about an assassination in Tahiti. You should never underestimate that woman. We'll regroup and take back what is rightfully ours. And... My true sons are at your disposal, and ready to follow your orders. Excellent. Let's get to work. General Anderson and Natalia Sokolova's new alliance has led to the true sons being embedded into the Black Tusk. They have been helping Sokolova grow her fleet of hovercrafts in DC. There are concerns that this could lead to increased mortar strike activity. Division agents have been tasked with taking down a new team formed through this new alliance. They are heavily armed and know exactly where to attack in order to do the maximum amount of damage. Charles Chunks Crawford had a background in the Navy as an ENT, or Electronics Technician Nuclear Power, before being recruited by the Black Tusk. He was highly skilled at tending to reactors on submarines, and preferred deep sea over the surface. He was known as Chunks when he first entered the Navy because of his severe seasickness. He discovered that he could handle subterranean life better than life on a surface ship, and asked to be transferred to the Nukes. Considered as the Navy's best and brightest, Nukes are known for being a bit eccentric, with some struggling to handle the stress and demands of the job. But Chunks embraced this position and saw himself as the ideal nuke. However, beneath his seemingly harmless nickname and impressive technical skills, lurked a disturbing and unsettling personality. Chunks was known to have control issues and an insatiable desire for power and control over others. His sadistic tendencies were evident in his disregard for value of human life. He would often take pleasure in manipulating and dominating his subordinates, treating them like mere tools to be used for his own benefit. In his mind, the ends always justified the means, no matter how many lives were sacrificed in the process. His twisted behaviour made him a feared and respected member of the Black Tusk, 
His superiors appreciated his unwavering loyalty and willingness to carry out orders without question. Chunks may have been a master at tending to reactors, but his true talent lay in his ability to manipulate and control those around him. first listen, these comps may not seem very significant, but the last one in particular is actually referencing events that played out in the Division Recruited novel. This is confirming that the game is playing out alongside the novels, and it's quite cool to see the crossovers here. To give some background, Rowan is a former Division agent turned rogue, and was once a part of the cell of agents that the novel follows. Rowan's family had been killed following the outbreak, like so many others but she was led to believe that the true sons were responsible due to the events that played out on Roosevelt Island, when in reality, this was a lie told to her by the cell leader. Her family were sent into a quarantine, but it wasn't the JTF or the true sons who killed them. After the outcasts took over and seized control of the camp, the division launched a strike and her family was caught in the crossfire and killed. The division killed a family of an agent and that was hidden from her. She would go on to weaponize a sample of the green poison and then release it into the water supply of an encampment of True Sons. The True Sons were decimated, but not before they had spread it to three nearby civilian communities. Hundreds of people died. But Rowan would then find out the truth of what actually happened to her family, and she took the betrayal hard. Two division agents were dispatched to bring her in for questioning. She killed both and then disappeared. Her actions drew the attention of the outcasts, they approved of her measures, and given that they are now leaderless, she obviously offered them something in return for their help. The attack in St. Louis happened while the cell was in pursuit of Rowan, who was on her way to attack one of the SHD cores. There were explosions, and the buildings around them started to crumble, and this is where Isaac announced, warning, radiation detected. The outcasts were using dirty bombs. Now it makes sense that Chunks is so concerned about this. Being a former Navy nuclear technician, he is more than well aware of the dangers of radiation. I don't think the story has caught up with what happened at the end of Recruited, so I won't talk about that anymore in this video. However, given Sokolova's response to this, there could be more crossovers to come regarding the outcasts, and I'm going to speculate more on this in another video soon.
The story of Chunks' demise began with a tip received by the division agents. According to their intel, Chunks was hiding somewhere within the West Potomac Park of Washington, D.C. The agents set out to take down the Black Tusk outposts one by one until they found themselves at the Lincoln Memorial. The Black Tusk had fortified the area heavily, and it seemed like a daunting task for the agents to get through. But they were determined to stop Chunks, and slowly but surely, they made their way through the facility. Despite facing numerous enemies, including heavily armed guards and warhounds, the agents were relentless in their pursuit. Finally, they came face to face with their target. Chunks appeared to be caught off guard and didn't put up much resistance. The agents swiftly cleared out his bodyguards, and in no time, Chunks was eliminated. Firstly, let's talk about the castle settlement. It has been years since the settlement was first attacked by the True Sons, using a weaponized version of DC-62. But to be fair, in-game it's only been a few months. There have been rumors around the castle settlement, but I haven't paid much attention, as there wasn't anything official to back it up. My first thoughts when we were directed there in-game, there is more to the story. We don't need another settlement, we've been fine without it so far. However, it does paint the picture that perhaps the JTF and civilians are doing a little better in DC than we've been led to believe up until now. I've always felt that the existing settlements and even the White House were barely holding on at this point. But if they're able to divert this much manpower and other resources, perhaps things aren't as grim as they've seemed over the last few months in game. However, like I just said, I believe there is more to this settlement. When running around and checking out the compound, you can see a lot of work going on. Comms being set up, electricity, foundations for buildings, farming spots, plus a number of JTF who look like they're just over this shit, and probably should have just called in sick. The underground area seems to have been locked off, but there is another way down there. Heading onto the street you can find this entranceway that leads you directly under the settlement. There are no guards or anything, but there are doors to be opened. It still works in the same way as the settlement, as in you cannot use weapons etc, except there really is nothing down there. I've been through it a number of times, and there's nothing, except for a few unmarked civilians. But back up in the main section, you can find a crafting table and a recalibration station. This immediately struck me as odd, as there are only so many locations that have this, and the other two DC settlements certainly don't. From everything I'm seeing here, the area feels incomplete. Not just because they're currently rebuilding the place, but that there is far more planned for the area in the near future. I feel like a lot of the assets here are just placeholders for the next few months, where eventually this place will be of far greater significance to the story and I'll expand on this idea further a little later in the video. When first jumping into Season 11, we meet Manny for the usual target brief, but then we are immediately sent to the castle to meet Wally. There has been an increase of hunter drone activity in DC, and she has managed to hack into a couple of them, revealing some intel. Now, this is obviously the way that the main comms are going to be acquired this season, but it's good to hear the hunters are still being featured in the story. Anyway, the first two comms we've received through this intel follows a similar path of the intel received in the Chunks Manhunt. What have you heard, Stovepipe? Rumors of outcasts working with rogue agents outside of DC. I spoke with Cal yesterday, and he has assured me that the rumors are just rumors. The report out of St. Louis? A complete fabrication. Nothing to worry about. Even if it were true, it's an anomaly, not a trend. Nothing for you to worry about. What about supplies going through the area? We have alternate routes. There is no danger of shortages, if that's what you're worried about. Hey, you talked to Chunks? I have. I assure you, there are no shortages, and we have more than enough to sustain us. We are in this for the long haul. The first one covers something I discussed in the Chunks Manhunt video. I'll have a link to this in the top right. But essentially, Stokepipe is asking if these rumors are true. Based on the recruited novel, they are 100% true. Yet for some reason, Natalia, or perhaps McManus, is denying it. I want to assure you that this is merely a hypothetical question. Okay. Hypothetically, what would happen to a mortar operator if they were to use a launcher that had previously housed a dirty bomb? Too many factors to consider. Exposure time, amount of radioactive material, amount of transfer. What kind of particulate? It wouldn't be instantly fatal? Of course not. We're exposed to radiation every day. By the time you're showing symptoms of radiation poisoning, it's generally too late. Thank you, Chunks. 
Why are you asking? No reason. I just like to be prepared for all scenarios. If you're worried about exposure at the plant, you should start taking iodine to protect your thyroid. That's very useful information. This to me shows that Natalia doesn't believe what McManus is saying to her about the events in St. Louis. Or maybe her and McManus are just trying to cover this up from their crew for some reason. What's more interesting about this piece of intel is what Chunk said at the end there about taking iodine to help protect the thyroid. The reason this is interesting is because of something that Wally said after completing the Chunk's manhunt. Guess we should start looking for natural sources of iodine just in case. Should probably start eating more fish and seaweed from Mari's exhibits at the aquarium. It took me a few seconds to click when I first heard this. To begin with, I thought this was an unknown name that would become more important over the course of this manhunt, as they don't tend to give names of characters unless there is some sort of significance to their story going forward. But some of you may remember this name come up in one of the classified assignments that came out in year one. This particular one was called Central Aquarium. You could be forgiven for forgetting what this was all about, and it certainly had me looking through the others for a bit of a refresher. But long story short, we were there to rescue Mari Singh and a number of other civilians at the aquarium that was being taken over by hyenas. But the rescue wasn't really the significant part. I'm not going to play all of the comms as this could be a standalone video on its own, but the intel from this assignment showed the interaction between Mari and her colleagues. They were short on supplies and worried about what they were going to do going forward when it came to feeding the animals under their care. Everything was locked down, they weren't able to get trucks in, and they couldn't simply take the animals away. They contemplated feeding the smaller fish to the large ones and mammals, but this would only be a temporary solution. Mari eventually acknowledged that the city is full of hungry people and that food is running out. Perhaps the best solution was to honour the animals and provide them as food for the hungry population, rather than just let the animals starve to death. But it wasn't just all about killing off the larger animals and feeding them to the people. The aquarium has a sustainable fishing program. They have the facilities to provide a communal fishery, a source of food for the starving civilians. This was certainly a big deal at the time, a sustainable source of food. But with everything else going on in year one, it was easy to have forgotten this. However, with the threat of radiation, along with the growing need for food, the mention of Mari and her fishery is no coincidence. She and her aquarium are something that we're going to have to fight for going forward. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to play the trailer and discuss what I think could be important going forward. We got used to winning. To defeating our enemies. Or turning them to our cause. Schaefer is still in a coma, so I don't believe we'll be seeing anything from him this season. I could be wrong here, he may make an appearance later, but I don't think this will be the case this manhunt. But now they have their own alliance led by Sokolova. And if the mastermind of the Black Tusk is coming to Washington, it will be to eliminate the division. That's why she needs Stovepipe. They don't care about the cost. This agent watch scene is something I pointed out on Twitter and Instagram. It shows that there are more than just trophies for the hunters, that they are drawing intel from them. But what? They already seem to know everything about each agent, especially given that Calvin McManus, as the Secretary of Homeland Security, has had all of this information around the Division agents. So what information are they gathering? Somewhat off topic, I'm seriously considering setting up my recording studio like this. I feel it would really put me in the zone. Only who wins. And finally, we have the White House going dark. To me at least, this symbolizes an attack, or at the very least, the DC base of operations is being targeted and brought to its knees. Maybe this is the end of Schaefer due to the power supply being cut. I don't think so though, or at least I hope not. There is a reason they've kept him alive in the story for this long. But I think this could be the answer to all of my questions around the castle settlement. It's probably a bit of a stretch, but that's never held me back before. I think the White House is finally going to come under attack. I've been questioning this for quite a while. The Black Tusks certainly have the overwhelming manpower and equipment to do this. Up until the castle sediment being restored, the White House appears to have been run by a skeleton crew, as the JTF numbers have dropped so low. Perhaps them sending so many people to rebuilding the castle sediment is the reason it's finally being attacked. I don't know, but whatever happens, I think the castle is going to be our new base of operations, even if just temporarily, while recapturing the White House.
Lieutenant Martin Bantam's background as a US Army drone operator gave him a unique perspective on warfare. He was able to control unmanned aerial vehicles and use them to target enemy combatants without ever setting foot on the battlefield. However, as time went on, Bantam would become desensitized to the violence he was causing from afar. As he transitioned to become a member of the True Sons, Bantam continued to use his skills to target enemies from a safe distance. However, his beliefs about responsibility began to morph into a twisted justification for his actions. Bantam convinced himself that he was not responsible for the deaths caused by his drone strikes, as long as he did not physically see blood on his hands. He was able to ignore the fact that his actions were causing real-life consequences for other human beings. This cognitive disconnect allowed him to continue his violent behavior without any remorse. It's clear that Bantam's mindset is a dangerous one. By disconnecting himself from the reality of the situation and the harm he's causing, he's able to justify his violent actions and become a danger to those around him. Lieutenant Martin Bantam is a cautionary tale about the dangers of detachment and warfare and how it can lead to dangerous beliefs and behaviors. Prior to the operation, Bantam expressed his doubts about collaborating with the Black Tusk. He had always been a loyal true son, but the recent alliance with the Black Tusk had made him uneasy. He knew that their ultimate goal was to gain control of the capital and rule it with an iron fist, but he wasn't sure that their method was something that he was able to be a part of. True Sons and Black Tusk are set up on the Potomac and ready to deploy, General. Thank you, Bantam. Hold tight. What are we waiting for? Wish I could tell you. Above my pay grade or above yours too, sir? It's need to know. But do you know? I know enough. Are you sure about these people, sir? I'm sure that if we want to win this war, Lieutenant, we need allies. But these allies? Do you have enough food? Yes. Do you have housing and clean clothes? Yes. Do you have enough weapons and medical supplies? Yes. Do you have enough mortars? Enough to level the city. So, do you feel like you have the tools and resources at your disposal to win this war? Absolutely. How do you feel about our new allies now? Better, General. Good. Hold tight and wait for orders. He was torn between his loyalty to the True Sons and the practical benefits of working with the Black Tusk. But ultimately, he knew that the True Sons couldn't have kept going in the way that they were. Their resources were dwindling and their situation was becoming increasingly dire. The True Sons were in desperate need of a game changer and this could be it. Initial recon sweeps are complete. Any updates on our friend? Captain Lewis has been moving between the White House and the castle. Castle? The castle settlement? Yes, sir. What about the DC-62? Extensive decontamination efforts have been made since Captain Wilson's attack. Looks like they're getting ready to reopen the settlement. Oh. Well, good for them. Wally's been seen at the castle as well. Makes sense. They were always close. No news on the other target. Natalia would like to hear that from you. Do you mind giving her a call? There's nothing to tell. Well, huh. she'd like to hear it from you. I'd rather not. Why not? Sir, she scared the shit out of me. Any updates? No, ma'am. Eyes on the target? No, ma'am. Do we at least have confirmation that he's still on sight? No, ma'am. Do we have anything? We have footage of him being brought back to the White House after Coney Island. He was badly injured. No aerial footage since. Is he still alive? No way to confirm it this time. If he's alive, they, they never let him outside. Bantam's aerial drones have shown what is happening at the castle sediment and the huge efforts going into rebuilding it, but also the movements going both in and out of the White House. They are now very aware of Captain Lewis's involvement with the castle being rebuilt, as well as Wally. They are also now aware that Barden Schaefer was taken to the White House, but they have no idea if he is still alive or not. I wonder if my suspicions are correct about the White House coming under attack. Could the potential for Schaefer to be alive with all the secrets he holds be the reason they attack? If we want to retrofit more mortars, I'm going to need more DC-62. Thank you for telling me, Lieutenant. General, does that mean you're going to send more DC-62? Yeah, at this point, contamination threats may not be in our best interests. Visible contamination. What are you implying? Rumors about radiation, sir. Oh, rumors? What rumors? About the plant? No, St. Louis. What about St. Louis? You really don't know, do you? Excuse me? 
There's nothing to know. I can't tell if you're full of shit, or your new friend is teaching you to be a fantastic fucking liar. Watch your tone, Lieutenant. I don't give a fuck about my tone. I want to know if I need to worry about radiation poisoning, sir. This comms continues the rumours that were started in the Chunks manhunt. And while we know that the attack on St. Louis aren't just rumours, I'm beginning to think that this isn't just a nice crossover to the novels. This is going to feature more heavily going forward, but I really can't put my finger on how at this point. Dirty bombs? Radiation? How would this assist either side going forward if these were brought to DC or New York? Or maybe that's the point. Perhaps those crazy bastards known as the outcasts are going to be the reason for the Black Tusk and the Division to pull a truce for a little while. But if that was the case, why is McManus, Sokolova, and maybe Anderson trying to hide it from everyone? Following the successful elimination of their first target, Chunks, Division agents quickly received intel on Lieutenant Martin Bantam's whereabouts. It was revealed that he was actively operating within the Foggy Bottom District of Washington, D.C., which prompted agents to launch a full-scale operation to take down the True Sun outposts in the area. With each outpost that was taken down, the agents gathered more information about Bantam's location, which eventually led them to the heavily defended compound of the Potomac Event Center. The True Suns were abundant in supply, and it was clear that this was going to be a challenging mission. Despite the odds, the division agents were well prepared and had the necessary equipment to take on the heavily fortified compound. The White Death, with its overpowered talent, determined, proved to be a game changer, and it felt more like target practice than an actual battle. As agents made their way through the compound, they eventually came face to face with Bantam himself. In an uncharacteristic move, Bantam decided to engage in the fight himself, showing a level of courage that was unexpected from someone who had previously hidden behind a screen. However, his efforts were no match for the well-trained division agents. With one swift bullet to the face, Bantam was taken out of commission. It's unclear whether he would have put up much of a resistance if he hadn't engaged in the fight, but the agents were relieved to have completed their mission successfully. The elimination of Bantam would bring them one step closer to tracking down their main target, Stovepipe. Mort cursed Kellogg's life took a turn for the worse when he developed a serious gambling problem. He found himself in debt to loan sharks before he even graduated from high school, and the debts only grew larger as time went on. Eventually he realised that he needed to do something drastic to get out of debt and avoid his collectors, so he enlisted in the army. He was deployed to the Dagger Complex in Darmstadt, Germany, where he quickly became known for his logistical expertise. He had a natural talent for managing supplies, and his superiors took notice. However, Kirst was never able to shake his gambling habit. Even in Germany, he continued to gamble on sports and other events, often putting himself further into debt. When the Green Poison was released, Kirst was on a weekend trip to Copenhagen and Malmo, where he bought a Euro jackpot lottery ticket. He played his lucky numbers and forgot about the ticket until the drawing the following Friday. To his amazement, all of his numbers came up, but his excitement was short-lived as he learned about the viral outbreak that was rapidly spreading across the globe. Kirst's luck seemed to have run out, but fate had other plans. He would eventually join the Black Tusk and become one of their highest ranking logistics officers. His expertise in managing supplies and resources made him invaluable to the organization, and he quickly rose through the ranks. His gambling habit may have put him in debt, but it also gave him a natural talent for taking calculated risks, something that would serve him well in this new position. As a member of the Black Tusk, Kirst was instrumental in many of their operations using his expertise to help the organization acquire the resources they needed to accomplish their goals. Despite his past, he had become a respected and trusted member of the group, and his loyalty to the cause was never in question. Um, you want me to reach out to Bantam or Kaplan? Kaplan. Bantam seems nervous. Huh. A lot of these true sons defected. They did. Looks like they weren't as loyal to Anderson as he thought. The trouble with following a charismatic leader. When you lose the leader, you lose your following. Agreed. Best part of working for a faceless organization. You're beholden to a power structure, not a narcissist. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic. No sarcasm. I signed on for the big picture. 
safety and security. <laughs> you know me so well. I do. And that's why I think you're the right person to reach out to Kaplan. We need to weed out potential traitors in our midst. You worried she's a traitor? No. I think she's got the right access, psychology, and skill set to spot them. Natalia is looking for any more potential traitors within the True Sons, and believes Kaplan could be the one to find them. This comms piece also shows the sort of loyalty Hurst has with Natalia and the Black Tusk. No updates on Schaefer. Thank you. Just wanted to confirm Bantam's report. Is he going to be a problem? I don't think so. He's too afraid of me to betray me. I don't know how anyone can be afraid of you. That's because you've never been on the receiving end of my wrath, Cursed. That's true. You have saved my life on more than one occasion. Have you found anything? Only thing a note, I've seen some specialized medical equipment going in and out of the White House. Could be for Schaefer, could be nothing. No way to tell without infiltrating the White House. That's a suicide mission. Stick to recon for now. Confirmation that someone's in a coma. But you can't confirm it is Schaefer? That's unfortunately correct. Source? We apprehended one of the cooks. And how does that confirm a coma patient? They were instructed to make meals for tube feeding and maintain feedline sanitation. But they never installed the line or saw the patient? That's correct. Said that there was restricted access to his room. Who has clearance? Uh, Manny, Kelso, Dr. Summers, and our old friend, Captain Lewis. Well, he sure fell into favor quickly. Is there an opportunity there? Perhaps. He's been turned before. Men like that aren't the most loyal. Captain Lewis has shifted loyalties twice in the past. We abandoned the JTF for the True Sons, and then once again more recently when he teamed up with the Division. Natalia sees this as a potential opportunity. They still haven't confirmed that Schaefer is in there, but they're certainly getting close. It's seeming more and more likely that if this attack on the White House does happen, that Schaefer is going to be the reason for it. Natalia knows that he has too much intel to give if he was to ever wake up. Are you worried about radiation? You've been talking to chunks, haven't you? No, stovepipe. Just take your iodine and calm down. You don't think the rumors are true? About St. Louis? Yeah. I think anytime people tell you a rumor is just a rumor, they're trying to cover something up. So yeah, I think the rumors are true. Shit. Don't worry about St. Louis. Worry about Fairview. Why? <laughs> You've seen the way they handle the nuclear waste. No. No, no. They would have told us. <laughs> Brother, I think your helmet's on too tight. I'm still not sure how the events in St. Louis would tie into the story yet. I don't see us heading over there, but maybe it'll have something to do with the future conflicts against the outcasts. However, what I find more interesting is the reference to Fairview Power Plant, not just from Kirst, but also from Wally right after receiving these comms. Ever since we lost Major Castillo, that place has gone to shit. I get why he had to take him out. That man's grief drove him to some really dark places. When Major Castillo was taken out, there wasn't really anyone to look after the plant. Yes, he trained a few of the True Sons to keep things running, but this was never going to be adequate in the long term. Bantam's training as a nuke more than justifies his concerns. However, he's now gone too. Natalia is a smart lady. Surely she is aware of what's happening here. But what is she planning? Forget DC-62, or even the green poison. Radiation and dirty bombs could soon be the problem. And as far as I'm aware, I don't think the Division has anyone qualified to fix it, so we can't exactly storm the area. As the Division agents received intel on Mort Kirst's Kellogg's whereabouts, they quickly mobilized and headed towards Constitution Hall, where the Black Task was conducting their operations. The team had to move cautiously and strategically, taking down various outposts one by one throughout the district to ensure their cover wasn't blown. Once they cleared the outposts, the agents discovered that Kirst had moved to Tidal Basin, a heavily fortified area controlled by the Black Tusk. The team had their work cut out for them, but they were determined to take down the enemy and put an end to their plans. 
they encountered fierce resistance as they made their way through the area, but their extensive training and superior equipment proved to be too much. Eventually, Kirst would make his presence known and approach the agents, exceptionally slowly. At this point, it's hard not to feel sorry for Mort Kirst Kellogg. Not only did he have a gambling addiction that would eventually result in him being placed into this very position the agents are facing right now, but he would also be trolled by the Black Tusk, who would put him in the hilariously clunky armor with a belt-fed minigun that the agents were more than familiar with by now. After clearing his entourage, the agents spent a little bit of time playing with their prey, until they eventually decided to show him how it was done by pulling out their own minigun and blasting holes straight through his armor. Beatrice Auntie Kaplan, with her deceptively sweet and unassuming presence, harbors a dark and dangerous side that lurks beneath the surface. Mocking the conventional expectations of society, Kaplan, having no desire to have children, would often joke about a future as an eccentric old cat lady. During basic training at the first target practice session, a new recruit playfully gave her the name Auntie. Shortly after, this new recruit, as well as Kaplan, would be involved in what she called a reloading accident that would ultimately claim the recruit's life. Any doubts of whether the incident was actually an accident would be cleared up after she shamelessly seized the opportunity to wield her newfound infamy. Insisting that everyone address her as Auntie, she sought to instill a sense of fear and respect from those around her. Auntie showed no guilt or remorse for her actions, and instead used it as a stark reminder of the ever-present danger and mortality that haunted their lives if they crossed her. But also, to solidify her position of power and dominance within the ranks. When she heard news about the True Sons aligning themselves with the Black Tusk, she was most excited about the fact that she would no longer go by the name Petty Officer Kaplan, and instead have people continue to refer to her as Auntie. We're in position, fully stocked and awaiting orders, General. Thank you, Kaplan. Auntie. Right. Thank you, Auntie. No problem, General. About those orders? Continue to do perimeter sweeps of all known division control locations and look for any weak spots or opportunities. And if I find any, you want me to move in or report back? Observe and report for now. Natalia has a plan and we need to support her vision. Do we get to know what that vision is? Eventually, when the time is right. We still don't know who we can trust. This alliance is too new, and Lewis has unfortunately brought too many people to his side. You worried about Bantam? Should I be? Well, is he still insisting you call him Lieutenant Bantam? Yes. It's like switching teams. Just because you put on the uniform, it doesn't make you a part of the team. And, if you won't even put on the uniform, how much do you really want to be on the new team? Right. Good point, Auntie. Permission to go off base. Why? I want to meet Cursed in person. Permission denied. I just need two hours. We can find a neutral place to meet. Why do you want to meet him? He reached out. Wants me to help root out the rest of the rats and traitors. We talking about Bantam again? No. Bantam's too chicken shit to do anything. He'll die before he grows the balls to defy orders. I don't know about that. He's harmless. I mean, unless you order him to kill people, then he's actually pretty good at his job. But he's not one to get original ideas. And if a bad actor gets in his ear? Oh, well, then yeah, he can be easily manipulated. You want me to keep tabs on him, just in case? That might not be a bad idea. But quietly, remotely, don't let him know you're watching. That's the only way I know how to watch. Permission denied. Why? Worried I'll draw too much attention? Need to stay on mission? Worried I'll get distracted or something? Who knows? <laughs> That's too bad. I was really looking forward to meeting you. Me too. Is it true you were stationed in Germany when this all went down? It is. You ever see combat before this? I've been deployed. What's your number? Before this? Um, 20 or 30... 
after 50, I stopped counting. Really? Yeah. Too hard to keep track. Not for me. What's your number? 372. <laughs> Were you deployed before this? Nope. Went through basic and joined the guard. I never got to see any real action until the JTF was activated. 372 kills this year? <laughs> That's impressive. 371. Actually. These columns are just a continuation of the conversations Kirst was having with Natalia. She has asked Kirst to get in touch with Auntie and use her to help weed out the traitors. These are all showing that Natalia doesn't hold the True Sons in particularly high regard, especially after Captain Lewis jumps ship with a large group of the True Sons. It also shows that Natalia continues to have absolutely no confidence in General Anderson. He has been left completely in the dark, and now has her men going around him in order to discuss plans with certain True Sons. You lied to me. You need to be more specific, Stovepipe. I know about the dirty bombs. What about them? Your little experiment here? Someone stole it and used it in St. Louis. What experiment? The goddamn dirty bombs, Natalia! Stovepipe? I have never approved experimental dirty bombs. Perhaps the isolation is getting to you? <sighs> You're full of shit, Natalia. I do not appreciate your tone. I don't give a shit. Get me out of here. I'm done. Finish setting up the base at Coney Island, and I'll send a relief team to finish your mission in New York. We can sort out this confusion when you get back to base. Through this interaction, we learn of the location of Stovepipe, Coney Island. It sounds like he is setting up a base for an attack on New York City. With all of these past comms this season, it appears Natalia could be planning to use dirty bombs on the city. Obviously Stovepipe isn't particularly happy about this and chooses to call her out. And who can blame him? Everything we've heard has led us to similar suspicions. One thing is for certain though, the disrespect he has shown, there is no way Natalia will let that slide. Auntie's downfall started with a tip that reached the division agents, revealing her presence in Washington DC's West End District. With this information in hand, the agents embarked on a mission to dismantle the True Sun outposts, progressing through until they eventually find out that Auntie was located on Roosevelt Island. The island stood as a daunting challenge for the determined agents, but undeterred by the overwhelming odds, they pressed forward, navigating the treacherous landscape of the compound. The area had been heavily fortified by the True Sons, presenting a formidable challenge for the agents to overcome, but step by step they would push through and eventually close in on Auntie. However, in typical division agent fashion, they would shoot first and ask questions later. They actually didn't get a visual confirmation on the target before one-shotting something through some foliage. They would have to run to the other side of the map to confirm it was her, and with this target down and all available intel gathered, the agents would be able to move on to the main target, Stovepipe. Though I hope her sister doesn't seek revenge, I don't think that fight would go down in quite the same way. Zachary Stovepipe Beatty possessed a unique and dangerous fascination with explosives that would eventually shape his path in unexpected ways. Trained as an Explosive Ordnance Disposal Specialist, or EOD, he initially immersed himself in the study of demolitions out of sheer passion. While his primary duty was to neutralize explosive threats, Stovepipe's insatiable curiosity led him down a dark path. As he delved deeper into his field, Stovepipe's obsession with the destructive power of explosives grew. He meticulously collected schematics, prototypes, and classified information on increasingly unstable improvised explosive devices. He pushed the boundaries of his knowledge, exploring the most hazardous and volatile designs, all in the pursuit of a fascination with watching the world burn. Surprisingly, Stovepipe's unorthodox collection didn't lead to the expected consequences. Instead of facing a court-martial for his dangerous hobby, his commanding officer recognized the potential value of his expertise and connections. This recognition ultimately sparked an unexpected turn of events when the Black Tusk took notice of Stovepipe's unique skills and approached him with an intriguing proposition. The Black Tusk saw in Stovepipe a person who shared their desire to exploit chaos for their own gain. They recognized his uncanny ability to navigate the world of destructive technology and the potential for him to become a valuable asset in their operations. 
Drawn to the allure of power, Stovepipe accepted the invitation to join the ranks of the Black Tusk. It was within this organization that his expertise in explosives would find its true purpose. In position. Inventory assessment complete. How are we looking on mortars? Even with the two new teams, we have more than enough to maintain control of the shipping lanes. That's very good. Let me know if we need to pull in additional resources. Will do. But honestly, this feels like overkill to secure the river. Better to overkill than be killed. <laughs> Funny. You need anything else from me? Not at this time, Stovepipe. Can't you just call me Zack? Wouldn't be professional, Stovepipe. I hate that nickname. Most people hate their nicknames. You didn't make Faye take a nickname. Faye was special. And what am I? Reliable. Presumably on Coney Island, Stovepipe updates Natalia on the status of the setup, including the mortar launchers that they'll be using to keep hold of the river. Why do you want to know that? Professional curiosity. No, there is no way to use dirty bombs in our mortar launchers without contaminating the launcher. That's what I thought. I just wanted confirmation. I don't like this hypothetical question. It's just a question. It's a fucked up question. That's the world. Is this about St. Louis? What do you know about St. Louis? Dirty bomb attack on a convoy. Rumors. Conjecture and fear-mongering to keep people from moving through the Midwest. You sure? Let me sort through the propaganda. You just keep digging through that intel and see if there's anything we can use. You got it, boss. W why? Humor me. There is no safe way to house this shit long term. Short term. Do you care if people die? Of course. <sighs> then concrete, lead, concrete and lead lined crates that no one touches without full radioactive protection at all times. With decontamination showers after, then deconstruct, destroy and bury the launchers after use. It doesn't make sense. The risk isn't worth it unless you want people to die of radiation poisoning. Thank you, Stovepipe. Seriously, is this about St. Louis? Was that us? It was not us. So it's true. St. Louis happened. Of course it happened. Why did you lie to me? You didn't need to know. These comms are obviously from before Stovepipe's outburst in the comms that we heard while hunting down Auntie. He brings up St. Louis twice, and Natalia even admits to lying about the events that happened there. This, on top of Natalia's questions about radiation and dirty bombs, he is right to be nervous. If this is what Natalia is planning, agents realize they need to close in on his position, and fast. When agents arrived on the island, it was quiet. Too quiet. In fact, there were no enemies at all, and sensors indicate that Stovepipe hasn't moved since the agents arrived. Eventually they would catch up to Stovepipe, except someone had beat them to it. He was already dead. It was a trap. From the Black Tusk hovercraft in the distance, a swarm of drones, as well as a couple of Marauder-class quadcopters, were launched on the agent's position. Agents attempt to reach the extraction point, but wave after wave of drones, mini-tanks, warhounds, automated turrets, and a heap of EMPs are blocking their way. They manage to quickly push through, but before Torres is able to pick them up, there is one small enemy that needs to be removed. But don't let the name fool you, that mother is Satan's Hellhound. And here I go a little off story and break the immersion. My wife uh, slash manager told me I should probably remove this part because it's a little bit off brand. But I promised a few of you that I wouldn't hold back on my emotions and true feelings about this part of the mission. So the following are actual clips of my first few playthroughs. Let's just call this an intermission. But feel free to skip forward a minute or so to continue with the story. Just f off, but for f**k's sake. F avocado. For f**k's sake. Ah, uh, why? Ah, f***ing f***. Hey, Alpha Bravo, you keen to jump on for a few minutes just to finish off the main hunt? Won't take long. Yeah, man, give me a moment. Why does he keep chasing me? What the f*** is wrong with this damn thing? You got this. He's actually not so bad when you're not being chased by him. Are you dead again? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I am. The fact that his name is Sparkles only makes it that much worse. After the agents managed to put a stop to the final target on Coney Island, 
comfortably, definitely without getting close to rage quitting several times. Torres was about to come in and extract them. However, this is when the true depth of this situation really came to light. While the agents have been playing at the dog park, the Black Tusk have attacked the White House. It all makes sense now. Stovepipe and the whole attack on Coney Island was just a distraction. Sokolova was waiting until the agents were off-site before taking down the network and then attacking the White House. The only reason they are able to communicate and use skills now is because of Wally's mobile SHD server. Fighting through the outskirts, agents make their way through the Black Tusk forces to meet up with Kalso at the White House. As the agents make it to the gates, they watch as several Black Tusk helicopters depart, with one of them carrying the perfusion bioreactor. At the compound, they come across a Razorback that has been set up on the White House lawn. After a surprisingly short encounter, given what has been experienced through this manhunt so far, agents would make their way through to the White House alongside Alani Kalso. What they found was a massacre. While all of the Black Tusk had cleared out from the compound, the agents were left with the stark reality of what had just occurred. Along with many others, Captain Lewis had given his life to protect the JTF and the base of operations. Through echoes on site, the agents were able to see that Lewis had made the ultimate sacrifice in order to give Manny the time to escape and hide with Schaefer. While Lewis was comfortably holding his own, it would seem that one of Natalia's hunters was able to sneak up on him and take him down by surprise. Kelso and Agent Sanders, someone we haven't seen since the Pentagon mission, approached the panic room. There, Schaefer and Manny have been hiding out. Schaefer needs to be returned to his bed, and while on their way, Manny and Kelso discuss how the Black Tusk was able to take down the network. Manny acknowledges that he overheard someone saying that the countermeasures worked perfectly. They know that Schaefer was the target, but as long as they have the mobile SHD server, while limited in range, their skills and comms are working. The next step is to get the White House defenses back online and find out whether this SHD network blackout is just local or is in fact a global shutdown. I'm impressed. Credit where credit is due. You and your little team of misfits managed to decrypt my comms. You passed the test. Manny, you really do have an eye for talent. First Schaefer, then Lewis, and Wally. Imagine my surprise when I discovered you even managed to recruit Vic. I thought you hated him after what happened at Odea. But here you are, welcoming old enemies into your house and giving them the literal keys to the castle. I haven't decided if you're a genius with boundless empathy or a moron who actually believes that people can change. People don't change. Most of the time, if you think someone has changed, it's because you never really saw them. You never look close enough to see if the person staring back at you is genuine or is hiding their true intentions. That's why you're so easy to fool and why I will always be two steps ahead of you. I have the Black Tusk, the real true sons, and the hunters at my disposal, while your agents have civilians chasing water bottles. By the way, Thank you for sending your agents all the way to Coney Island to check on Stovepipe. It's too bad you couldn't recruit him, too. But he forgot his place in my organization, and I do not tolerate disrespect. Since you may be a moron, I'm going to make my intentions very clear. This city, this country, this world belongs to us. We will take what is rightfully ours... And there is nothing you can do to stop us. Isn't that right, Vic? Fuck you, Nat! What did you do with Mari and Cindy? Don't worry, Vic. I wouldn't hurt them. They're too valuable to the future of my operation. It's not every day you find a woman who can build and operate a fish farm. She really is quite the catch, Manny. When you're ready to surrender, I would be more than happy to reunite you two lovebirds. I hear stress can do terrible things to a pregnancy, especially in older women. Manny, if you really do love her, you might want to hurry. Oh, an agent? I hope to see you soon. This single, long, condescending comms pretty much explains everything. All intel we've been receiving throughout this manhunt has been compromised. This whole time, everything we've been listening to 
has led us to this setup, to have us removed from the equation so that the Black Tusk can sweep in and clean out the White House while Mummy and Daddy weren't home. It's unlikely that Natalia had anything to do with the dirty bomb attacks in St. Louis. It was just the easiest way of getting our attention. But it isn't to say that all references to the recruited novel were just there to scare us into moving out. But I'll get into that a little more soon. Natalia has also confirmed that she has Vikram Malik, a name that we briefly heard about earlier on after he betrayed us at the Odea Tech building. As well as Mari Singh, someone we suspected would have a larger part to play after several comms messages this season alone. She not only leads the team at the Central Aquarium, one of DC's only sustainable food sources, but she is pregnant with Manny's child. We're going to have to be careful with any direction coming from him. After the loss of his friend, and now this, he's going to be a mess. But there was one other name that Natalia mentioned, a name I didn't recognize, Cindy. I'm not going to lie, if this is the person Natalia took, I hadn't really paid her much attention up until now. Based in the White House, Cindy is a drone operator that has been involved in scouting and alerting agents to numerous threats in DC. It was also her drone that worked the coordinated JTF and SHD work on Coney Island when extracting Vitaly Trenenko, as well as the drone that was hacked by Aaron Keener before he escaped. I'm not overly sure what Natalia is hoping to gain from Cindy, but I'm sure we'll be finding out soon. On the way into the White House, Black Tusk operatives could be heard saying, the countermeasure is still active. And while Manny is wheeling Schaefer out of the panic room, he says, I overheard someone say the countermeasures worked perfectly. Given all of the references to the recruited novel this season, I feel that it's pretty safe to say that this is another reference to Thomas Parrott's work. In the novel, the countermeasure is the program Myra used to neutralize the rogue network and tech at the Kansas core. This essentially keeps the core from being destroyed by deactivating the EMP failsafes. Natalia has obviously managed to recover Myra's code and has used it to shut down the network and attack the White House. So my question, how did Natalia get a hold of this? I don't recall anything in Compromised, although I'm now going to read it for the fourth time just to confirm this. This will probably be one of those things I bug Thomas Parrott and Lauren Stone about over the coming weeks. I've actually held back on fully talking about the novels out of respect for the author and spoilers etc. But now that we've reached the end of the first novel, in game, maybe it's time I have a run through. 